It's that time of year. The air, crisp. The trees, bare. And just as the winds of change beckon in a new season, same is true in collegiate sports. The exchange. What happened? The tables just completely turned. The gridiron makes way for the hard court as the world awaits that which is the most dramatic of all. This game is the most unexpected game I have seen in my life. Rivalries, Davids, Goliaths, and upsets. Did you blunder, Rook? Completely blunder the oh, and resign. Man, Alexander, I was about to give you the biggest hype up speech. <laughs> this is the time of year for brackets, soon to be the time of year we've all come to know as March Madness. And on the 64 square chessboard, some things are different, but some are the same. Oh my goodness, how is there not double exclam on this move? The CCL is back as college's best compete for their moment in the sun. <laughs> Just immediately <laughs> blunder and resign. We did it again, oh Joe! My we jinxed it again! Will the Billikens of St. Louis University three-peat and cement themselves as a dynasty in collegiate chess? Huge congratulations to SLU winning the championship. Or will six-time national champions Webster University bring their championship pedigree to the CCL? There are President's Cup winners. Favorites, underdogs, and sure to be plenty of drama. This is the 2024 Collegiate Chess League Spring Season, and it starts now. Welcome to the 2024 Collegiate Chess League Spring Season presented by SIG. I am your host, Anna Kramling, and I am joined by CCL expert, Joe Lee. Joe, are you looking forward to week six? Anna, words do not do it justice how excited I am for this week. This is the most exciting match that we've had all season. I absolutely cannot wait to see these matches, and it's such an honor to be here with you. So thank you. And uh, yeah, what, what do we got today? We have the top four teams playing against each other. We're going to be starting by having UTRGV facing Missouri, and then we're going to be seeing the match of the season, St. Louis versus Webster. Joe, what match are you the most excited about, do you think? I mean, number one versus number two, Webster versus SLU. This is unbelievable, super exciting. I cannot wait to see if the defending champions in St. Louis can take down the undefeated Webster and hand them their first loss ever in the CCL. So we got UTRGV versus Mizzou first, which is very exciting as well. Number three versus number four. This very well could be the finals preview in playoffs. Uh, Anna, wait, hold on. Were there any players in these teams that you like really wanted to keep an eye out for? There is one that we should definitely keep an eye out for, Joe, and that is Mikhail Antipov, because he arguably has uh, the best, or he's arguably the best player of the season. He has the highest percentage win rate. And not only that, he also has the highest amount of brilliances. He has five brilliances this season. So I am really excited to see what he brings on today. But Joe, you saw him playing the last season too. Did, did his play stand out to you or what did you think then? Honestly, Anna, I feel like these stats are kind of, they just don't do him justice. Uh, five brilliances so far this season. When I watch him play, it's like he's playing five brilliances per game. <laughs> so definitely we're going to keep an eye out for his games. And what's absolutely mind boggling is that he's not even board one for his team. He's not even the highest rated. Grigory Oparin is Mizzou's board one. So this Mizzou team is unbelievable. But up against UTRGV, they might be the underdogs in terms of the uh, rating, but they're actually technically ahead on tie breaks uh, so far this season. And they're the only team that was able to take Webster to overtime. Plus, they beat SLU last week in a spectacular eight and a half, seven and a half finish. So UTRGV actually might be the, the favorite. Uh, what do you think, Anna? No, I agree with you. I think last week's match was just so exciting and we didn't expect it. I mean, SLU are the back-to-back -back winners of the CCL. So seeing them lose to UTRGV just really shows how strong this team is. And with that, we have the match one board assignments. Now, Joe, does anything stand out to you? You said that uh, we see that UTRGV have a little bit of lower rating, but does that really matter at this level when it's Blitz? Honestly, 
anything can happen. And we saw that last week with SLU, uh, UTRGV. We saw their board four, Ikan Ozner, be the hero taking down Batsurin in that fourth round to win the match. And he might do some damage here today. He's going to play against Oparin in the first round. So I cannot wait to see these two teams go at it. Uh, we have the players getting ready here, actually. So we got all four of them on camera. I cannot wait to get these games started. Neither can yeah. I. I agree. I agree, Joe. I am so excited. And something that I think is really funny is the fact that Oparin is actually playing from a car. <laughs> so we <laughs> see him right now sitting in a car, just getting ready for the match. But I just find it so fun to see where the players are each week. We see some of them being super comfortable from their own homes. I mean, sometimes we see them in hotel lobbies. And today, we see them in a car, I suppose. <laughs> so I wonder if that's going to affect this play in any way. But yeah, Joe, I think that this is going to be an amazing match. I would say this is going to be one of the best matches if, if it wasn't because of the fact that we have Webster versus Slu right after this. So really exciting week. And this is now one of the final weeks before the playoff. I mean, the CCL is, is, is soon going to be going into playoffs, which is really exciting. Yeah, this week sets the stage for week seven next week, the final week of the regular season. So this is such a huge match. Both these teams tied right now in the standings. A win could put the team in potentially second place, depending on what happens between Webster and Slew after this. And that second place spot is so important. It guarantees you directly into the semifinals, plus in the prize money and a buy for quarterfinals. But we have the games starting here. We have Move one from Raja, board four from Mizzou, taking on Victor Gajic. And what's crazy is that we saw Raja, I believe, had a, a four out of four score uh, last week, um, which wasn't on broadcast, but we did cover it on the CCL channel. But he's board four and he had a perfect score. Yeah, he's super strong and I think that is really important in a team to have a strong board for. We see in the first round, it's always that uh, there's the biggest uh, difference between the boards. We see board one playing versus board four. But if you have a strong board four that doesn't lose, then I think that that is a huge advantage for the team. So let's go ahead and check out uh, the game maybe a little bit more in depth. We see the opening right now and we see a really early A4. So this looks a little bit funny. A4. The knight is on b6 and black played a5, I think, to stop the pawn from pushing to a5. I think that's the reason uh, that happened. But we see white immediately getting a lot of space over there. So this is looking really, really, really comfortable, I think. Uh, what do you think, Joe? Yeah, knight on b6, that, that piece has been moving around uh, really early on. So white had an early e5. And that's kind of what happens when black doesn't contest the center with the pawns, right? We see instead of Fianchetto getting ready to castle. So perhaps putting pressure on with the minor pieces rather than the pawns right away. So Raja with the white pieces, he's got a comfortable position and uh, space on the board against board one from UTRGV Victor Gajic. I will say though, Joe, I don't hate knights on b6. I mean, you know that that is one of the main things in the cow opening. <laughs> you put the knights on b6 and g6. So I am pretty comfortable with the knights there. So I don't hate the fact that black has a knight over there. But we see immediately uh, the queens that have been traded. But Joe, did, did you see that the cow opening became a, a theoretical opening now on chess.com? I did see that. That was perhaps one of the most exciting announcements in the entire chess world recently. So, I mean, how could I have missed that? That was definitely a huge highlight. I, I appreciate that, Joe. Thank you. But yeah, here we see the, the queens being traded off. And actually, I quite still like this for white. That pawn on e5 may look a little bit weak because there's, there's no other pawn defending it. But it's actually right now stopping uh, black from, from getting space, I feel like. With that pawn on e5, black cannot play e5 themselves. And it's kind of tying Black's pieces down a little bit. If you go Knight D7 now, for instance, I am wondering what happens after E6. Doesn't that look scary? E6 is one of those moves that is super annoying to deal with. That's why we have the Bishop here. If the Knight goes to D7, like you said, E6, and now Black's forced to either move the Knight again and have you capture on F7, say goodbye to Castling, or you're going to have to take that free pawn and be left with double isolated E pawns and that's going to be an immediate target uh, for these white pieces. So, yeah, 
definitely going to have to question how to bring out these pieces, but um, probably castling white's going to continue their development. Maybe the knight's going to come in for this pawn. Uh, maybe we see this pawn push. That's going to make it even harder for these pieces to get out. So right now I definitely like uh, Raj's position, but I'm thinking we should probably take a look at some of the other games. I think especially uh, board two, Luca versus Sean. This is actually uh wait, sorry. That should be Antipov versus Sean. Yeah, no, I mean, we definitely want to see Antipov. Um, so here we have it. Here we have the game. Wow, the first immediate thing that I'm thinking about is the fact that Sean just has a lot of pieces on the king side. That rook, the bishop, the knight, it looks like he has a very active position for, for having the black pieces. Um, what, what do you think, Joe? Do you like it for him? Yeah, rook lift is always really nice, especially if we can get the second rook in. So Antipov's last piece to develop is definitely his queen. So they can bring the second rook to the F file. And we might see some uh, potential exchange sacrifices even. Or we could see the rook come to the G file at some point, putting more pressure on white's king. Uh, so definitely some, some aggression here with the black pieces from Antipov. And he's also up on the clock. Not a surprise. But Sean Rodriguez Lemieux, we mentioned this... Uh, before he is actually one of the the world champions um in, in the juniors so he's definitely one of the top talented players in the entire ccl and he proved it being the best in the world uh just a couple of years ago so we see he brings his knight back offering a trade he doesn't like this uh this tension so he's gonna resolve it here i think that's what you want to do typically you want to try to resolve the tension when you're being attacked and it's not really that clear to see how you continue the attack. I think queen d7, the idea is to bring the rook, connect the rooks, put some pressure on f2. But now the rook is being kicked away. So rook f7, that knight actually, it's a little bit of a funny maneuver going knight h2 and knight g4, but it's quite a normal maneuver to get that knight a little bit more active. And after that, I mean, the knight at some point might even be able to go to e5. So it's a very common way of uh, playing it. We can also, we can see here now the, the bird's eye view. We can also maybe check out uh, board number two, Gleb Dudin versus Luca. I think that that looks uh, like a pretty exciting game with the pawn on f5. You see that, Joe? I mean, white is just going for the attack immediately. Um, and those dark scores are looking really weak too. So I'm really liking white's position there for Luca in that board. So let's see what he is up to. Yeah, this is a tough task for... Uh, a UTRGV team. Their top two boards have to play against Raja and Luca. Luca with the white pieces here looks like he's being very comfortable. This bishop's blocked out by the pawns. This pawn's a goner. This uh, bishop is very happy on the dark squares. This bishop is just dealing with the pen. So right now, white has all the play. And I honestly don't envy Gleb Duden right now. This is a tough, uh, tough way to defend. We see the queen now going into the center. Yeah, I think that white's position looks amazing. And I like the fact that white doesn't just have a lot of space on the king side. White has space on the queen side too. I mean, you typically say that you play on one side of the board, but he's just playing on both sides of the board and he's just better on both sides of the board. So queen d4, the idea is to probably at some point play bishop h6 and then try to target that g7 square, uh, but also to target the d4 pawn. So we see now that after rook c8, the eval bar goes quite quite a bit up for white. Um, so I'm wondering now, what happens if you just simply capture... Can you capture the pawn on e4? Knight takes e4, knight takes, and then bishop takes e7? Intermediate? I'm wondering if there's tactics with this discovery. If the knight were to take our bishop, if we take, the queen takes, and that helps support this e-pawn. So... There's also ideas. I'm wondering if uh, if knight takes here is anything, but I suspect the reason why we play queen d4 is to meet that with bishop h6 and threaten checkmate. Um, so we just see the calm, cool, collected rook a e1, getting that last piece in. So before going for any trades or pushing anything, you want to make sure your army's at full strength here. I like rook a e1. It's a very classy move. And black now putting pressure onto c4, white just defending that, and then we're going to pick up this e-pawn at our leisure. Yeah, I think you can pick up pick up that pawn almost whenever you want. That is why we're not seeing Luca having any... Um, he, he's not 
doing that really fast. I mean, he knows that he has time to do it. So he's first activating all his pieces. And I think that that is one of the things that we see at top level chess. They are not impatient, these players. They bring all their pieces to get the full uh, setup. And then after they have the full setup, after they have all their pieces working, that's when they attack and that's when they go for uh, grabbing pawns. So we're seeing now this move knight g4, which is one supporting the knight on e5, but it's also right now offering a bishop trade. And white needs to deal with the situation. What will white do with the bishop? I feel like you almost, almost have to take um, unless you have something crazy with f6, which I don't really believe in. But yeah, bishop takes e7 looks really natural, right? Or, or does f6 somehow work? I don't think f6 works because we have three pieces controlling the square, only two for white. So I don't think we'll see f6. I think we'll see the trade. Yeah. King takes back. And now maybe we'll try to kick out this, uh, this knight and then play for f6 unless of course the knight comes back maybe we'll just pick up the e-pawn yeah but i'm just scared about the knight on h4 i mean we have a knight on h4 that's hanging right now so i don't know if the idea is to go something like rook takes e4 and then queen takes h4 if we have h3 but i think it looks a lot more natural to just go g3 and defend the knight something like that just looks crazy once again you see the difference between us and these players is that these players don't go for these crazy lines. They just play <laughs> natural chess, defend everything, and they are calm and patient and collected. <laughs> so yeah. I like this move, G3 defending the knight. And now probably maybe knight G2. Knight F4 could be an idea at some point, too. Yeah, I think uh, white knows kind of a, a decent plan on how to attack here. I want to look at back on Raja's game, I think. He's looking really good here against Victor Gajic. This could be a huge board four versus board one upset, although perhaps not an upset considering Raja's used to this. He swept <laughs> last week. Yeah, Raja is so strong. And we just immediately see Bishop E4 now just picking up the rook. And I mean, now white is just material up. So it still looks like it could be a little bit, maybe a little bit tactical, but... I don't know. This just looks so good. I suppose the idea was that if knight takes b2, he wanted to go rook takes c2 and pin that knight. So that's why we're seeing bishop d3. Very nice. If knight takes, the rook is hanging. And now knight takes b2, defending the, the bishop. And this is just right now so much more material for white. We're literally seeing an, a rook and a piece up for white right now. What is happening, Joe? <laughs> that's, uh, that's a lot of material. And Gajic's also low on time. He might just flag here. I think this is just immediately going to be over. Yes, he might pick up that knight, but I mean, I was, rook up. up rook. <laughs> it's it's res There we go. Wow, so, huge upset there, Joe. That is amazing. Raja yeah. is back. First point, and it goes to Mizzou's board four. Not a surprise if you if you tuned into his last match, but uh, this could be bad for UTRGV, but we can't count them out just yet. Uh, Mizzou does have a player playing from his car. I hope he's not driving. <laughs> no, I definitely don't think that he's driving. There we have a par and is playing from his car. He's actually doing quite well with time. I, I would think that he would play a little bit slower there, but he looks comfortable. And he's facing Ekin Osener, who was one of the stars of last week. He played so well for UTRGV. And I'm excited to see what he brings on today. So this is the position that we have. It's looking pretty balanced, uh, equal pawns in an endgame. But with the, with, with the bishop pairs, there's still a lot of play, even though it's an endgame. Yeah, this is pretty even. I want to check out back to uh, Sean Rodriguez. Game. Oh, we have a result. Antipov. So two points now for Mizzou. Wow. Antipov, he's back in it. Yes, I mean, it, it looked like Sean had a decent position before. I don't know what magic Antipov was able to do to win this game, but we are talking about Antipov, and he is the person with the most brilliancies this season. So I, I, I am not surprised, to be honest. Fantastic result for Mitsu so far. And here we have these players having very little time, Luka versus Gleb Durin, and looking slightly better for Black. I mean, he has those knights in the center. But with little time, anything can happen. I like that move, Joe. H5 to go H4. Yeah, he's just bringing the attack. He doesn't uh, care about this <laughs> knight outpost. Bringing the king, no. trading the rooks. Bishop takes. Now it's kind of even uh, once the dust has settled. Pawn push, though. Giving up that pawn to ruin the structure. 
How do you feel? Is that a gamble? Do you think that's going to be a risk? I think that it's very scary to leave that pass pawn. I mean, this king is activating itself through e5, but what is going on? What happens if you just start pushing that h pawn? This could definitely be a long-term advantage for white. And we see black is kind of moving around his, his, his knight. But what happened? Knight f1? Wasn't that a pawn? Knight f1 check winning the h2 pawn? Are we going to see a draw? I don't think so. I think the king is going to move. He knows that he's better here. That h Might pawn is... For it. Yeah. <laughs> this is insane. He cannot take the knight because then the pawn just pushes. Then the h pawn is unstoppable. Oh my goodness. Yeah, knights are horrible at catching past pawns. This king cannot take the knight. And that pawn is pushing anyways. The king cannot get closer to that pawn to stop it because of uh, the knight on f4. So this is just an amazing position for white. I, I think we're going to see white winning this. I, I really do. I am uh, really surprised. I don't know if we jinxed it somehow, Joe. When we walked in, we thought it was an easy draw, but no, definitely not. Those, th that's the magic of pass pawns, you know? Wow, wow. there's one check. The knight's going to be just in time to cover promotion, but can this king go after the A pawn and you get a second pass pawn? No, that is knight here is sacrifice, wow. forcing wow. the knight into the corner, and now this knight is going to pick up the rest of the pawns. And now or, this is or... just free roaming, I mean, for white. White can just move around their king, move around all their pieces, and black is stuck with this knight on h8 pretty much. So that is the reason why white is so winning. Um, I, I don't see how you're going to defend this. I mean, you're doing this little attempt of pushing the a pawn, but yeah, this is now just... The problem is that there's going to be another queen too. It's not just one, it's two. Yeah, so turns out that h4 pawn push from Gleb Dudin turned out to be the losing move here. Luca converts that extra pawn, and Mizzou, they're up three to nothing right now. What is going on? I really thought we would be seeing a closer match. This is just round number one, obviously, but still, 3 0 is huge. So here we have uh, Oparin playing from the car versus Osener, and this is looking quite, this is looking really nice for, for White. I mean, that is just a, a free extra pawn that you have on B6. Yeah, and we see. Oparn's trying to trade off that bishop. Osnir, he was the hero. So even though it's 3 nothing right now for Mizzou, UTRGV's board four, their hero, could come in clutch here and get some points for them, avoiding the, the round one sweep. Yeah, he was the hero last week, and it would be a fantastic comeback story if he could be the hero this round as well. But now we're just seeing the king coming up, and what we're going to see is Black's king is going to be uh also going up attacking this bishop on h3 so it might be a situation where both bishops need to be sacrificed for the pawns at some point yeah this is going to be a draw but yeah. uh i came up with a a nice nickname for oparin because he's playing from his car we got to call <laughs> him okarin <laughs> that's great joe that is a great name he looked pretty upset after this draw obviously is board number one drawing board four but i mean we saw uh board one for utrgv losing to missouri's board four so board fours are playing really well and the final score that we have after round one is three and a half to a half missouri taking a big lead from round one what is happening, Joe? Is, is Missouri just, just this strong, or do you think that UTRGV just had a bad round? Honestly, it might be a mix of both. I do think Missouri is this strong, and I think UTRG is also strong enough to compete, but they had a really rough start to this match. I think that they can definitely turn around, though. There's still three rounds remaining, but Missouri is definitely in the driver's seat, no pun intended. <laughs> You're doing some great puns, Joe. <laughs> I love that. Let us know in chat if you think that Missouri is going to be taking this home. We can have some predictions going. Or do you think that Texas Rio Grande will be able to make a comeback? We have seen comebacks in the past and there are three more rounds to go. The players are right now getting ready for round number two. We see Missouri's everyone is, is pretty happy. I mean, I'm seeing Raja here smiling and talking and he has a big smile on his face just like he should have. We can see him over there now smiling once again. And yeah, now we need to see UTRGV making a comeback. I mean, otherwise, they're going to be going into round three and four with a really bad score. So they cannot lose uh, three points down now this match. 
yeah, three points down is tough, especially in round one. I mean, Mizzou only needs like five more points and there's 12 games left. Like they're, they're definitely set themselves up for success uh, after that start. So the only way they could have been better is Oparin could have, could have won his game, but Osner, he's a tough, tough, uh, tough customer. So <laughs> UTRGV, they're relying on all four boards, but they're they're top boards. They gotta they gotta pull it together. So they can't always rely on Osner. He can't carry the team to win all by himself. This is a team match. So the rest of them gotta wake up. Yeah, they definitely do. Is is there any of these uh, games that you're looking forward to seeing the most? I'm kind of looking forward to seeing Roger, to be honest, against Gleb Duty. And I mean, the Roger story is fantastic. He's been playing so well. So I'm excited to see what he can do against. Uh, against board number two but we can maybe start with uh with this game whenever it starts we see club Durin coming back to his seed getting ready now for round number two yeah we have this game started uh victor he he needs to he needs to perform so he's board one he lost to raja and to be fair raja did sweep last time so putting him at board four is just such like a curveball like you can't let the rounds distract you from the talent of these players to Mizzou. It doesn't matter what board they're playing on. Like we said earlier, Antipov is one of the most talented players to watch. He's not even their board one. So Mizzou will hit you on all four boards. <laughs> Victor Gajic is board one from USRGV. He needs to get points wherever he can. So he didn't get it against Raja. He's going to try his best now with the white pieces here against Luca. And that's something that I say every week. I mean, you might think college chess, oh, these players are not so good. No, that is not the case. I mean, here in the Collegiate Chess League, I think that is what we're showing, that these players, they are the top of the top. They're extremely strong players uh, that we're seeing each week. And yeah, I mean, these are very strong grandmasters. I, I, think, I think it's really cool. I say it every time, Joe, but I don't know how they have time to both study and be this good at chess. I wish I had time to do both, but I don't even have time for one of those two things. <laughs> 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 oh you're definitely a very talented player yourself anna and i i'm sure you could go to school if you really applied for it and i bet these players are probably looking at you on stream and man like they're like wow she's not in school like she's she's doing a great job with chess career you know uh so no matter you what you're doing just as long as you're you're happy doing it i'm sure these players are very happy although maybe utrgv might not be happy after uh their score here today uh but this is a huge match because like i said these two teams are tied in the standings currently so this is like a tiebreaker match and this is really crucial for these teams going into week seven because they want to put themselves into the best chance of making a top two spot because they want that quarterfinals by they want to be guaranteed in the semifinals and if they have a chance uh, it starts now, and it really depends on the following match, Webster and SLU. So lots on the line here today. This is round two of this match. It's pretty lopsided, to be fair, but UTRGV, they have a great opportunity to, to get right back into the swing of things. They do, and we're seeing right now uh, their board number one facing Missouri's board three, and I like how actively Missouri is playing. I mean, look at that, Queen H5. Just a very active move. Um, and even though it looks pretty balanced, I, I kind of like this for Black, I think. I like the fact that the F file is open. I like that there could be situations where we could see that Rook on F8 coming into play. Probably White will have to play Bishop E3, and I think that's why we saw this move H3 to prevent Knight G4 from targeting that Bishop. But if Black can at some point get the move e5 in, I just feel like all of Black's pieces are going to be very active. The bishop on d6, the knight, everything. So, yeah, what do you think about the position, Joe? Do you, do you agree? I definitely agree. e5 is the move that Black needs to play. And how do we know this? Well, this pawn is a backwards pawn right now. It's targeted by the rook. We see a trade here on c6. Pawn takes, and now this knight jumping in and making sure to keep this e-pawn blockaded. So even though Black's pieces look really well placed, it all kind of depends on this e-pawn. And right now, Luca's not going to get it. White's doing a fantastic job of holding it together. And that's why we see c5 trying to undermine this d-pawn, this support for the knight. Uh, we could see this capture, but that would help uh, Black take more control of the center. Here we have 
two pawns for black, no pawns for, for white. So yeah, pretty balanced so far. We'll see if, uh, okay, there, there goes the, so instead of pushing the pawn to e5, you just give it up. And now this f pawn is sneakily defended by this knight on d1. That's typically not there, but yeah, <laughs> I think white's pretty good. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the knight is typically not on d1. It's obviously blocking the rook from coming into play. But we're seeing, I really like this move, rook e8, because what black is trying to do is that they're trying to get uh, the rook in. But king f1, activating the king, getting it more towards the center, but obviously also preventing black from going rook e1. And we see that the knight and the bishop are kind of trying to maneuver. Maybe at some point black will want to play c5 and d4 to try to get a little bit of space. But the eval bar is actually favoring white right now until I said this. <laughs> um, but yeah, now we see now we see Bishop F4 targeting the pawn on, on C7. Why do you think this is better for white, Joe? Um, I would say probably the extra pawn and the pawn structure is better for white, even though black yeah. is definitely ahead in development. White definitely lacking here. But I want to give a shout out to Count Live, who's in the chat. He's conversing right now with the Benjamin Bach hype fan uh but apparently oparin is driving right now from missouri to texas there's a lot of texas tournaments um that either just concluded or are about to happen there's always stuff happening there and i saw a fan from texas earlier uh who's cheering on for utrgv so let us know who you're cheering for uh in the chat that is amazing. I love that Oparin is just playing so much chess that he's competing in chess on his way to more chess. That is just uh, amazing. So let's check out how he is doing right now. Um, we just see this rook activating itself on d7. Always super amazing to have rooks on the seventh rank. They're very active. And there's definitely ideas now of going rook d1, maybe rook e7 bringing up that rook to d7 if allowed we see that sean isn't really allowing that with bishop c6 targeting the rook and now if you go rook e7 i mean that rook might get stuck so you don't really want to go rook e7 now i think as something like king of eight could get very scary but it's probably what he's thinking about right now um but in general just doubling up the rooks and we see this kind of bishop uh versus knight situation where typically bishops and rooks work a little bit better with each other than what rooks and knights do but it doesn't really have to mean anything in this position. Yeah, this is an interesting imbalance. Uh, I love how you put it. Oparn is playing chess in between his chess. <laughs> like he's driving from one chess event to another and playing in a parking lot. He's not driving. Uh, don't chess no. and drive. But <laughs> No, no, don't, don't chess and drive, okay? <laughs> Very important thing. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's uh, it's really cool to see. And I saw someone in chat saying that looking at how Missouri is playing now, it looks like they're going to win the whole thing. That's how well Missouri is playing so far this match. And and I do agree. Like you see Missouri playing like this and you're kind of thinking, you know, could they win the whole season? They're, they're just playing really well so far. Yeah. And uh, a reminder, Mizzou plays against SLU next week. So this is definitely a huge uh opportunity for them to really pile on some points in the standings like if they're going to win the first round three and a half to a half you got to be thinking how many more points are they going to get because right now they're tied in standings with utrgv so as many points as they can get plus the match win that's going to set themselves up for success and a huge opportunity to try to take down slu next week uh but first they still have to get through utrgv and we see sean he's putting up a good defense here against Oparin, who he was the only player that didn't get a full point. Um, so they're definitely bringing a good game to Oparin, but they got to get the rest of their game up against the rest of their players. So is there any other uh, games that you wanted to check out, Anna? Let's check out Raja. I am excited to see what is happening over there because it actually looks like Raja might be having a little bit of a worse position. So we're seeing now that white's pawn structure looks a little bit funny um, with those double pawns on the F file, but white just has this really strong knight coming up to F5. And I think there's a saying that goes knife F5. I, I think it might have been Kasparov that said that. And that is just because the knights are so strong there. And especially when black has a pawn on H6, it's really difficult to get rid of that knight on F5 because you cannot play G6 and kick it away as the pawn on H6 is hanging. So now we're seeing the immediate threat of 97 check 
winning uh, an exchange. And so black, black needs to stop that. But not only that, the pawn on d5 is also very weak. It's an isolated pawn. So I'm, I'm really liking this position right now for white. I mean, even if white loses this f pawn, how does white activate their pieces? Sorry, black, activate their pieces. Yeah, we see Rook getting to the seventh. Uh, you pointed this out in the other game, but immediately hitting the, the bishop, skewering the pawn, we see a counterattack, bishop a6. So trying to remain active, but uh, it's tough. Like you said, how are you going to kick out these knights? Um, I'm wondering here for white, do we play king f2? Yes, defending the e-pawn first and saying your a-pawn's not going anywhere. My e-pawn's more central, more important, and I'm going to kick out your knight at some point and just uh, finish bringing in perhaps the rest of the pieces. And um, yeah, this is looking really good here for Gleb. And you can also tell on the clock, Raja is down under a minute and he's just continuing attacking the Epon. Wait, he takes on a seven and now wow. the Epon should fall. Wow, yeah, I guess he didn't, uh, he thought that was fine. I'm wondering if you could have done something else to offend the pawn, maybe something like knight g3, I'm not sure. But rook takes a7, now we see bishop takes e2. And you definitely do not want to take now, I think, knight takes e2, because the rook then comes in maybe uh, as if, as, as, yeah, there we go. So we see instead knight d6 targeting the rook and targeting the pawn on f7. And maybe this was the idea for him to give up the pawn on e2 but be able to activate his knight and create all of these threats as if now rook f8 then the bishop on e2 is hanging so you need to somehow defend several things at the same time yeah this is actually kind of tough because the rook is tied to the e file just to defend and he's only got 15 seconds to find it he goes for the counter attack but now can't we take this with the counter attack yes we can now you have, all of this is hanging everything is hanging take here. yeah you can go knight takes h6 and just win a bunch of pawns and he has so much time to figure this out. The 15 seconds for Raja are really going to, I think, determine a lot in this game. Really difficult to play this position with such little time. And not only are you losing some pawns, I mean, that b6 pawn is so weak, that d5 pawn is so weak, white's king is more active. I think we're going to see a win here by, uh, by Gleb Dudin. Yeah, Gleb just has to figure out how he wants to do it. Perhaps taking on e2 is better because you're going to force the rooks off. And we see exactly that. Uh, if you take this knight, then you're just going to get into this uh, this winning pawn endgame, I guess. If you could play a4, b4, a5, get the outside pass pawn. You could also sack the knight. You can also just take the knight. Uh, lots of options here. Maybe yeah. we could tune into another game. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's maybe tune into the game we haven't seen yet, which is Antipov versus Osenir, and I see a huge time difference there. Antipov <laughs> has three minutes, and Osenir has 14 seconds. How has this happened, Joe? Although the position, even though the evil bar is saying that it's, it's uh, completely equal, I think it actually looks like it could go uh, in a lot of different ways, considering the fact that, uh, the, that white has these three pawns on the queen side. This is crazy. Essentially, you think, oh, the bishop could always sack for the pawn, right? But no, yeah. the knight could just block. And that's exactly what we're seeing wow. here. So this pawn is going to break through, but white has three pawns as well. And this pawn is a couple squares away from promoting as well. So we see the king getting out of the way, preparing to push. And now we have the queen, a king discovery. King here, and now how do you prevent this promotion? There's a check. The king goes up. Is this just a perpetual? I think it almost has to be because you cannot uh, trade the queen for that A8 pawn because white is going to have two more pawns to promote at that, at that point. So I think you do have to just go back and forth. And there we go. The game ends in a draw. So, wow. Oh, so you're still like he drew the first game against the pawn. He's drawing now Antipov. He's once again just having a fantastic, fantastic season. So we see, we're seeing now um, board number one for Texas, Victor Gossick versus Luca. And wow, look at this rooking game. Is that just two pawns up for white? I think it is. Yeah, Victor, he's, he, he gets one back, but oh my God, two seconds for, for Victor. Less so than five point. seconds for both players. This is as bullet <laughs> game as it becomes. I mean, you go King G3 threatening checkmate. King has to move. Back and forth checks. Wow, this is just a win for white. 
This is beautiful. The extra pawn and the better rook. This king is just forever tied in the corner. If we go here, I don't know if this is... Black's trying their best to hold on to everything. <gasps> wow. And now, yeah, rook, rook g7. Uh, if the rook moves, or the g6 pawn is hanging. And you're also threatening maybe f5. Not anymore, as now the pawn would defend. Going How does back, he break through? He's trying to find a way to break through. He has so little time to figure it out. He's bringing his king all the way down. That looks quite funny. This rook just has one extra square to stay on the g-file and defend this g-pawn. And if the king ever tries to attack the g-pawn, then this rook will take the f-pawn. And it, the evil boy is saying that he's completely winning, but he's right now having to figure out how to do it. Practically, it's not as easy. He goes rook f6, defending the pawn on a6 and targeting the g6 pawn, but now from a more active square. At, now he's also defending the f4 pawn, so he's able to move his king which he couldn't do before. Yeah, let's see if Victor can convert this. This is such a tight position. Luca's trying his best to hold on to everything. And so far he's succeeding. I mean, White has not found the plan to break through yet. I think he needs to get the king in somewhere, but it's not easy. No, but I'm just wondering, can you not, do you not want to bring the king to the queen side? Yeah, but then you're going to get checked all over the place. Yeah, that is the problem. So maybe, yeah, so he's probably just going to try to go for that G6 oh. pawn instead. Wow. Oh, he oh! gives up the A pawn. He gives up the A pawn. Oh, wow. my goodness. And he just, it seems like he just blundered it because he shaked his head and he realizes that this is now just a draw. And that is what time trouble does to you. Wow, what a hold here from Luca. And wow. he's taking advantage of the pen here. Trading just everything. Like a draw. Wow. There it is. Victor, he could have had a great chance to get UTRGV back in it, but Luca says not so fast. I'm going to hold on, win your A pawn, and hold on to the draw. And we see Mizzou's lead, though, from three points down to only two. So we did have three draws and one decisive result in that round. So maybe the pace slowing down a little bit. Only Gleb was able to get a point, and that's very important for this UTRGV team. And they could have gotten an extra point from Victor Gajic, but Luca holding on to that advantage for his team. And Eki here once again, just playing really well. Uh, but I mean, in the final two rounds, we are going to have to see Texas Rio Grande making a comeback because they're two points down. Missouri is playing so well. And I don't know, Joe, do you think that Texas will be able to make a comeback in the final two rounds? Well, I think that if they were able to hold on with Victor Gajic to that win, then yeah, that would have been the game. That would have been like one point difference, uh, which is incredible after that first round. But I do think Mizzou is going to hold on to it. But UTRGV is not ready to say goodbye just yet. They have two rounds to make up for it. I definitely believe they can do it. I think so too. And you can once again, let us know in the comments or in chat if you think that they will be able to do it. We have two more rounds to go, but follow the Collegiate Chess League on X, Instagram, and Discord to stay connected to all things college chess. From podcast updates to match recap reels, the CCL socials will keep you covered on your favorite players, teams, and rising stars. If you're not following those handles, do that right now during this break. We will be right back. One pawn. Five suspects. Bring your deductive skills to the chessboard this March and help solve the mystery. Was it the movie star, Tina Tempo? The heiress, Beatrice Bishop? The Green Pawns coach, Remy Rook? Tournament organizer, Madame Mate, perhaps? Or the arbiter, Professor Passant? Awesome. Play them all, gather the clues, and find out who done it on chess.com. Looking for new ways to enjoy chess? Check out our schedule of chess.com community events today. Mondays, play rapid opening roulette and expand your opening repertoire with a new opening each month. Tuesdays, compete against other untitled players in Untitled Tuesday. Battle your way to the top in Arena Kings on Wednesdays. Join the crazy fun of the Variance Community Series each Thursday and finish the week off each Saturday with the blistering Community Bullet Brawl. 
all happening in the community club on chess.com. Hello, can I get 50 elo back, please? Because one of my friends played on my account and lost 50. Thank you. I've got friends like that too. When I'm frustrated or in a bad mood, <laughs> something or strikes. Maybe my a friends, little they... bit, you know what? Maybe a little, maybe, you know, I don't know. It's been a good night. <laughs> yeah. Now I have friends just like that, man. They, they come on my account. I wake up in the yeah. morning. Yeah. Well, the good news is um, better to have friends who lose you rating points than gain you rating points because then your account might be closed for cheating. Pro tip. I am deeply sorry for the language I used. I will never ever ever use vulgar language again. I'm sorry please unban me please. You are my star and my sunshine. <laughs> I go to bed dreaming of you and when I wake up I think of you again so I ask kindly please chess.com come with me to POM. Hugs and kisses. <laughs> we love you too. Unmute that man. We love you too. I love all members. I feel like we were being taunted just a little bit there. Um, but at the same time, I'm not one to judge anyone's speech impediment, you know? And so, welcome, welcome, you whiskily wabbit. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> and, and it's a gaming site. You know, when people write in and they've got the right sense of humor, it means a lot to us. Because, you know, yeah, that's, that's sure. the kind of um, the vibes stuff. we want. Classified, classified trading is a game, really, that you're playing with competitors and basically every market participant in the world. My path, I came in as a poker player, but I think that the main thing that everybody has in common is a sense of competitiveness and interest in, in gaming and strategy in general. Yes, you can actually use gaming skills for your career and for something to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Welcome back to week six of the 2024 Collegiate Chess League Spring Season presented by SIG. Right now, you are watching UTRGV take on Misu. But be sure to stick around. Coming up, the two CCL teams will face off. St. Louis University will take on Webster University, and that match will be amazing. Joe, we are a few moments away from round number three, but right now we are seeing Missouri having a two-point lead versus UTRGV. I thought this match would be closer, but Missouri has just proven that they are so strong and we need to be able to see if UTRGV can make a comeback. Do you think they can do it in, in these last two rounds? Yeah, in round two, I think they proved exactly that. They had a rough start in round one. Missouri really taking it to them three and a half to a half. So three point lead is nice, but UTRGV just run round two. So if they can compete, uh, com complete that, performance twice in a row then it's a tied match so two rounds left 
They just need to get one point in those two rounds to tie it. Definitely anything is possible still at this point. Uh, that, that last round was huge for them. We are right now seeing the players getting ready. And once again, most people are sitting from their comfort of their own homes. But that is not the case for Grandmaster Grigory Oparin. He is sitting in a car right now. And he is playing this chess tournament from a car. It might be one of the first time that is the case. Joe, what did you call him? Did you say that uh, Okarin? Was that what you called him? <laughs> yeah, that's his new nickname from now on. So, uh, Okarin, uh, he's playing in a parking lot, apparently. So I wonder if that is actually going to, to impact his ability to, to play, especially in time scramble. Like, I'm assuming he's on a laptop. Like, how is he on the Zoom call? Is he playing from his phone? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm curious as well. And I'm also surprised that the internet hasn't had any bad uh, impact. I mean, you would think that in a parking lot, the Wi-Fi is worse, but I guess not. I guess not where he is. So the round is going to start in just any moment, and we're going to be seeing some very exciting chess. Once again, these are the teams uh, that are ranked third and fourth in the standings right now. So this match has a lot at stake as both teams want to get into the top two standings to be able to go directly to the semifinals. So this is a very important match. And I mean, UTRGV really does not want to lose here. So the match is starting. Let's maybe start with Antipov versus Vic Victor Gossick. And Antipov being one of the, the best players this season so far, having uh, the highest win percentage rate. Uh, and am I seeing this right? A4, Rook A3. What? Wait a second. <laughs> right? <laughs> What are we witnessing right here? What is happening? A4, C4, Rook A3? Uh, Rook G3? G3? <laughs> is this official random? Is this chest 960? What is happening? What is uh, Antipop doing? He's really spicing things up here with this opening. Uh, H4! And now H4. <laughs> I mean, Joe, I was giving him all the credit. I was saying that he is the best player. He's the one with the most brilliances, which is true. And is this the way you create chess brilliances? Maybe it is. But wow, I mean, it's kind of turning into a more common position with the pawns on C4 and D4. But A4 and H4, is he going to go H5 now? I mean, one would assume that would be the, the logical follow-up. We see D5 attacking this knight. The knight's going to go into the center. Uh, maybe a, a, an offer of a knight trade. But, you know, while Count Live is in the chat, I, maybe this is a great opportunity to ask Mizzou's coach, is this some, uh, some prep that uh, perhaps Christian Carilla taught him, or is this Antipov's own preparation? Uh, I would love to know the answer to that. Is this approved by the coach, basically? Has someone approved this opening? To be honest, the engine is kind of approving it. I mean, it, it, it's not saying that he's in a much worse position, you know? Imagine Rook H4. <laughs> if we see that, I will give him... Uh, an applause for the bravery that he's showing here in one of the most important matches for Museo. He is playing this kind of chess. And honestly, I love it. Joe, do you like this kind of chess too? Well, you know, I, I, I am not surprised that you love it. The owner of the cow opening, maybe Antipov got jealous and decided to come <laughs> up with his own, you know, rook lifts opening and, and putting the rooks on G3 and, yeah, I don't know. Uh, imagine, I just really want to see Rook H4 though, because I, I think it's, I guess you're going to get forked. <laughs> but <laughs> you get forked, yeah. Point, you know, why not, right? Yeah, that's He's the problem. I suppose. H6, right? Or even yeah. taking twice on G6. Like, this isn't so, so easy. So, okay, now Knight A3. So, two pieces have developed through A3 so far, and maybe this Bishop later. Like, uh, yeah, this. I would have thought going to C3 made sense, but okay, he's got to guard C2. And Antipop had this move instantly prepared. Look at the clock situation. It's three minutes to 4.45. Yeah, I just don't think Victor knows what to do. I, I wonder if he's ever played against this before. I mean, he's a grandmaster, but I don't know how many times this has been played. And now maybe at some point we can see your idea of going Rook H4 or maybe Bishop E3 targeting that knight on d4 because it doesn't have a lot of squares to go to now that the bishop is picking up that f5 square what happens bishop e3 bishop e3 uh you know that's a great question so 
I'm do you have to go e5 but then you can take on Pisan and take on d6 maybe i i suppose the pawn on b2 will be hanging but this still looks very good for white if no honestly i don't know what's the computer one the computer wants ah e5 defending this way yeah and if we have on Pisan, the knight can take back and defend itself the pawn on d6 is still hanging, but I suppose there's bishop e5 maybe. So maybe you have to go knight b5 to prepare that then. I'm not sure. But anyways, I think he's analyzing all of these things right now because it's a very forced line. But h6 is also a threat. If you play h6, the bishop has to move to maybe f6. But that is taking up some squares for the knight. And I think I think white just needs to decide if they want to keep the tension or what they want to do. If rook e3 is a move I was not expecting whatsoever. But it's the move that we're seeing. <laughs> yeah, I think this is just a new variant of chess that we're witnessing. Actually, the coach confirmed count live in chat saying that this is Mizzou house blitz prep. So this is some special concoction, perhaps, uh, that was made in Columbia, Missouri. Um, but OK, we see capture on h5. Rook takes back bishop coming back. And now the rooks are doubled on the third rank. And this king is never castling. So. I mean, yeah, I, I'll i say this is a first in CCL history. I've never seen this before. This is going to inspire me to study this opening. If this is their blitz special, if Antipov manages to win this game, I promise that next time I stream, I will play this opening. I will go <laughs> after this, I will study this, and in my next stream, I will play it. So what's happening now? There's knight c2 check? Is that just the fourth? Oh my goodness, now King E2. This is uh, all, all part of Antipov's prep, I'm sure. This is like a <laughs> delayed bond cloud. I mean, this is an exchange down. He played this so quickly, and his face is making me think that this was prepared, that he wasn't just blundering a rook. But I wonder, <laughs> if you just take the rook, are you not just an exchange down? Do you really have compensation for it? Uh. <laughs> I, I mean black is like not taking it right now he's he's questioning his life right now i guess oh my god he doesn't even take it take it it's <laughs> insane it's just the free rock <laughs> oh my god i mean this wow. is like some sort of jedi mind trick perhaps this is actually amazing. I mean, Victor is seeing that he's facing Antipov who's having the best win rate so far this season. Antipov would never blunder in exchange, right? Antipov would never do something like that. So you cannot take it. This is just psychological stuff. Rook c3 defending c4. But I mean, yeah, and also defending, I guess, bishop d3 still. Also threatening rook c2. Yeah. And now the knight, I mean, what, knight b4? Or... Now the knight has to move. I mean, now he's not losing the rook anymore. You can maybe even... What is happening? The knight is going uh, up to g4? What happens? Rook takes c2. Is this not just material gain? Oh, there's queen f2, there's Anna. Queen f2. Let's there's queen f2. c2. But c5 so, okay, first. He pushes c5, yes. Beautiful and now move. he takes on c2. And now we see c4 attacking f2 once again. But hold on. Can't we just... Yeah, bishop to e3. Antipov's wow. done it. He's put both rooks on a3, h3, no castling. King is on e2, knight on f1 or g1, bishop's still on f1, queen's still on d1, and yet he's up a piece. <laughs> Only Antipov can do this. I don't know if it's through his chess. I don't know if it's through his mind tricks. I don't know what it is, but I know that only Antipov can do this. Joe, you should study this opening too. I want us both studying this opening after this. I'm going to put that as homework for you. <laughs> oh my goodness. I have homework now. I mean, honestly, this is this is actually a dream position. We see finally the the, the rook gets taken, but only after the, the knight has dropped off. We see castling. There's no g-pawn, by the way. Rook h3 already threatens mate. I mean... Honestly, yeah, if I could play every opening like this and, and be up a piece uh, or two pieces for a rook, like, this is incredible. There goes another pawn, but actually, I, I don't like this this last pawn grab because that helps uh, black get active with some pieces. Um, yeah, yeah, black now maybe getting some activity, but, but still, this king isn't so... I mean, it's funny. I'm saying black's king isn't safe, but look at this king on e2. So I don't know. Knight out. This bishop still has to come out. Um, yeah, rook's double, though. This isn't actually quite over yet. No, I mean, I agree with you. I think that the pawn on c4 was actually quite nice to keep there because 
it blocked black from attacking white's king. Now that that pawn is gone, it's a lot easier to attack the king. And I thought the king was going to go up to f3. I thought that was the safe square, but now there's a knight on f3. So maybe knight g5 is a, is, is a move we're going to see now. Threatening, well, not really checkmate, but at least threatening h7 and allowing the king to come up to f3. I don't know, but I don't like the idea that the king is now a bit stuck here. Yeah, there wasn't king f3 because after rook c1, the bishop would be hanging. Uh, but like, yeah, this this bishop still has no legal yeah. moves, and the king is definitely exposed. So grabbing c4, perhaps a bit too much, uh, for Antipov. Look at these rooks now, completely taking advantage of that, uh, usually using that c file that's been opened up. So game is still underway. <laughs> We're yet to see if Antipov can can make this opening work. I mean, I think he's kind of proven it, but he's still struggling. So. Knight to d4 helps guard c2. Uh, yeah. But I'm wondering if we can just take that uh, because if knight takes, then even though c2 is covered, the queen now can join in on the attack on b2. And again, if the king runs up, there goes this with a threat of uh, f2 as well. Um, but if you give that bishop, reminder, your king is uh, without a g-pawn. So uh, there's no immediate check because the bishop can just come back and block. But Still, queen takes and rook here is a huge threat. Um, it is. So, okay, instead, queen tripling up now on the C file. And I'm wondering, how does Antipov get the bishop out? I have no idea. I mean, my idea before going king f3 was the fact that if a rook ever comes to c2, then if rook takes f1, the, the rook will be hanging on c2. The queen will be able to take it. So I, I thought that that was the plan. But that was not the plan, instead we're seeing knight b3, this is a fork, but you have a queen c2 check, and now trading queens, and I, I suppose now the king will go up to f3, but this means that the pawn on b2 will fall. At least white's bishop will be getting out, but white is also able to get that pawn on a5, so we're seeing now just, wow, look at that, bishop e2, the bishop gets out blocking f2 at the same time. Wow. When when the bishop finally could come out, it comes out right when it's needed in a defensive manner. And we just simply see two knights versus a rook. Um, and yeah, I mean, the rooks are really short on squares too. D6, I wow. love it. Here, now knight takes, we're going to be threatening checkmate in one. Just amazing. I mean, yeah, just amazing to see Antipov play chess. Honestly, I feel like it's an honor watching this chess. The bishop moves to give that escape square for the king, but he has 48 seconds versus 6. This is such a difficult position to defend with little time. Is there knight a 5 check at some point? I don't really know. I mean, yes. there is. There we there have it. it. <laughs> uh, okay, but now the knight's under attack, so maybe just, yeah, g4. g4. Computer does not like that. Okay, I like, yeah, now, now the king is a little tethered, right? Um, because the bishop's going to be hanging if we move it. So g4, h5, definitely a good try here from Victor Gajic. He's not going away just yet. Even though it looks like two knights are better than a rook, this position is very complicated. It is extremely complicated. I mean, we've been stuck in this game, Joe, because it's been so exciting. But there's, there's results on the other boards. We have draws on board two and three, but we have a decisive result, and that is that Raja actually beats Sean. So that is huge. Raja is back winning with the black pieces. So, so far, we, uh, yeah, we, we still see Missouri having a big lead. So this game is going to be really important. Yeah, and I think Antipov has gotten through the worst of it. He's laying down some checks. This knight is pinned. Otherwise, I'm sure there'd be some sort of mate. Um, pawn push to defend the knight. This rook comes back defensively. King gets out of the pen. And now, can we give... Is this not just uh, winning another exchange here? It, it definitely looks like it, Joe. Knight g5, there we have it on the board. That king is so out of squares. Bishop d3, beautiful mail. Putting that bishop on the same diagonal as the king. And now you get the king out of the way. You move that knight at some point. You get a discovery. Or you just target the pawn on f7 and win a pawn and almost checkmate the king there too. I mean, this king on h7 is just, just, yeah, just so weak. This is going to be a checkmate. I don't see it being any other way. 
There we go. Yeah, and, and Victor agrees with you. He he had had enough, so he resigns. And, I mean, what a game. We watched this for the entirety of the round, basically, so from start to finish. Antipov must have heard me say five brilliancies per <laughs> match. No, this was maybe not five brilliancies, but five completely new opening ideas. Uh, A4, Rook, A3, and he made it work. So, wow, what a spectacular game. Let us know in chat what you think about this game, but I am inspired by Antipov. That is what I'm, th what, what I'm feeling. We see that he played five great moves, and yeah, this was a crazy opening, but he was able to take it home, and he's not even smiling, you know? It's like another day at work for him. <laughs> so he is, yeah, just amazing game, and right now Missouri is leading 8-4. Joe, this is crazy. If Missouri in round number four just gets a draw, they've won if they just get a point in any single game they have won the match so yeah it looks like it's over for Texas Rio Grande yeah honestly you to be needing a sweep on all four boards probably not gonna happen but uh maybe Oparin's internet and his car dies down and I don't know something else uh could lead to some miraculous events but yeah as it stands Mizzou they bounce back after the halftime and uh, they win that round with two wins uh, from Raja and Antipov, as we all saw. So they're definitely looking to, to win here. And they're looking to win by a lot as well. They're not done yet. They need to get as many points to put themselves ahead of UTRGV in, in the tie breaks and perhaps even overtake one of the St. Louis schools. Uh, so, yeah, one round to go, four games left. Antipov, I mean, imagine, Anna, put yourself into your opponent's shoes, right? You know yep. you're playing against Antipov. You're preparing for him. You're looking through his games. And <laughs> I don't know, maybe there's some Sicilian. Maybe there's some Roy Lopez that you're looking over. And he hits you with A4, Rook A3. How would that make you feel? I play against the Grandmaster, and he goes A4. And I think I almost jump out of the chair, Joe. Like, I think that something is extremely wrong. But he proves that it's not. And the opening didn't even turn out as crazy as I thought it would. I mean, he just had a fine position. So, I mean, this is once again inspiring me to feel like openings don't always matter that much in chess. Sometimes you can just play very active things that you understand and get a good position out of it. And that's what we saw in the Antipov game. So we see now finally old players coming back. They're drinking some water. They're getting ready. And the games are now starting. So we're seeing... The players playing against their respective boards. So we can maybe check out a parin uh, who's playing as Victor Gossick, the board ones facing off each other. This is a little bit more of a normal opening, not an Antipov kind of opening, but <laughs> a more standard theoretical line. Yeah, this is a uh, more traditional chess as we're used to seeing. Uh, and I think Oparin, what, he only has draws so far? I don't know uh, if he's gotten any wins yet no and in general like uh we haven't seen anyone with perfect score today so the games are definitely very balanced which i think is fun obviously it's amazing when we have a hero who wins all games but it's fun to see that the games are being pretty balanced even though missouri is right now leading by four points so yeah we see quite a quite a standard position the bishop lex bishop is gonna fiank head almost probably and probably we'll see a6 and c5 and the bishop on b7 targeting that diagonal and targeting the e4 pawn yeah this is definitely a decent position i think oparn's pretty used to it he's only spent one second of his time <laughs> and now it's white's turn so um typically white is the one that can kind of dictate the pace of the game because they are the ones that typically choose the opening and can play into their prep but oparn he's dictating the pace here uh victor gaji he's about to be under four minutes uh, and this is really a game that, you know, he's got the white pieces, he's board one, but of course, Oparn, uh, or in this case, Okarin, if I can keep <laughs> saying that as much as I can, uh, he's trying to, let's say, uh, dictate the pace of this game. No one is stopping you, Joe. Um, we will see when Oparin looks back to the stream if he stops you from future rounds. But so far, nobody can stop you. <laughs> so yes, he is playing in a car right now. And he's playing very fast. Like, it's crazy. One second playing in a car. Knight takes b5. Wow. This is a peace sacrifice. Oh, man. Wait, so hold on. What is, what is this idea here? Pawn takes... 
Like, I guess the queen comes in. Oh, look at this. Wow. Yeah. Queen, queen D5. D5. Or I was, yeah, no, queen D5 has to be the idea. I was thinking if it was bishop takes F7 uh, immediately to then go queen D5. But queen D5 immediately looks stronger, threatening queen takes F7 and the rook. And we see knight B6 defending the rook, but also allowing for the queen to defend on F7. But now the pawn on B5 is hanging. And so basically, you're not really winning the piece back as white, but what you're saying is that Black's king is so weak and you're going to win so many pawns that it's going to be worth the sacrifice. Yeah, three pawns versus, versus a piece. That is a balanced trade, technically. Um, it'll be very interesting to see who comes out on top here because the queens are traded and we see, oh, wow, it, the line goes wow. way deeper. Look at how fast they're playing. Is this theory? Is knight takes b5 theory? <laughs> Is this a peace sacrifice we didn't know about? We're, we're going crazy, I mean, like, oh, peace sacrifice. No, Ann and Joe, this is main theory, apparently. Like, what is happening? <laughs> wow. we, we didn't even see the sacrifice. We're like, what's going on? And this guy already had, like, five moves busting out, uh, just completely ready for this. And, uh, okay, so what even is the imbalance now? It's, it's uh, bishop versus two knights, but we have how many extra pawns? Is I think we three? have three. Yeah, we have three pawns, but I think for it to really be like something really amazing, we have to win the pawn on a7 as white and get those those pawns connected on the queen side. Otherwise, I feel like it's a, an extra piece when there's so many pieces left. It's definitely worth a lot. If you're able to trade down all pieces as white, that is a different story. But right now, with black having so many pieces left, I think black should definitely be slightly better at least. Definitely. Um extra piece you can use that to attack and to to get some pawns back but extra pawns you can use to promote to queens so uh as long as black can hold these pawns back and don't allow the pawns to start rolling then it should be good for the piece but more or less everything right now is pretty even uh i don't like this last move so much from black putting a pawn on a dark square this bishop could be a happy piece one day attacking these these dark square pieces. Um, so typically with knights against bishops, you want to try to utilize the opposite color complex. But we see Victor Gajic has set himself up really well, well here. Pawns on light squares, bishop on a dark square against pawns on dark squares. Uh, but maybe we look at some of the other games so far in this uh, fourth round. Let's do that. Yes, we see a draw between Luca and Sean. Let's maybe check out Antipov again on board number two, who's playing as Gleb Durin with the black pieces. Now, it looks like uh, we're seeing, yeah, here we, oh, okay. Knight takes, bishop takes. Knight e7 threatening the bishop. So this is looking quite nice for, for white, isn't it? I'm trying to right now count the pieces. It's, it's an extra pawn for white in this position. Yeah, extra b pawn for white. Definitely pretty happy with that. Um, we see the knight hopping into f5. Um, maybe lining up a sacrifice here. Um, I don't know. This this black king for Antibov, I definitely think, is a bit safer. Um, maybe the rook wants to come to the e-file. So the extra pawn, it's backwards right now, but it can be pushed. Um, actually, it can't be because the knight would fall. So... Yeah. Black's keeping everything tied together right now. That's what I was going to say, actually, that that B2 pawn is a pretty big problem for, for white. And I mean, at some point, yeah, I, I don't know when, but if you can go queen B3 and if you can start doubling up on the B file as black, you are going to have a long-term just uh, advantage, I feel like. Because if that B2 pawn disappears, not only are you losing a pawn, but the A3 pawn becomes really weak too. So... I, I am quite, uh, yeah, we, we will see. I think that is what black has to try to do to get the pawn back. But obviously white is right now a pawn up. So obviously there is that, um, there is that advantage. So we will see a little bit what happens in this game. We can maybe also take a look at Raja versus Ekin Osinir on board number four. So we don't miss any of the games. Here we have it. So Raja playing with the white pieces has been playing very well. And uh, I feel like we have here, Joe, two of the like amazing board fours of the season. Yeah, I mean, to put these players on board four is like 
almost a crime uh, because <laughs> on any other teams, like especially in the lower divisions, these would definitely be the best players, uh, like not even close. So I love how Raj is playing this. He's got both rooks in the center. Queen doubled on the E file. Light square bishop pointing straight at this king. But it is opposite color bishops, and black does have, I think, the better pawn structure. White's pawns are separated here. This king may be a little bit weaker on h2 with pawns on f2 and g3. So we see the queen trying to take the long diagonal, and uh, maybe one day black can get a rook to the back rank. But more or less, I think, with the activity of the rooks, it's uh, more or less still pretty even, actually. So we got to first defend our rook here. Yeah, we do. And uh, like you were saying, white's pawns are pretty bad on a2 and c2, but that bishop is like a standing big pawn with a hat, you know, kind of unifying everything together right now. Um, but I think something that's interesting is that a lot of times actually in attacking positions, the player that is attacking the most can benefit from the fact that there's different colored bishops because it becomes harder for the opponent to defend if the only piece, if the only minor piece you have left is um is is a different colored bishop so you see queen d3 here you see queen d3 defending the rook and the engine didn't love that move i suppose it might be because it's kind of eliminating some squares for the rook we see now king h8 uh, and joe is this a free pawn i'm taking that pawn anna but okay wait but we see the <laughs> the rooks just tripling up we have three attackers only one defender now so king h8 definitely a very questionable move here from uh, Ozner, UTRGV's board four, maybe F6, but then this rook's going to be even happier on the seventh rank, and we're going to start targeting the G pawn. I mean, if F6, that rook is the happiest rook on earth, I think. Like, after something like rook G4, I had the pawn in G7 is so weak, you cannot go rook G8 to defend it because you have that bishop, that very sneaky bishop on B3 looking down towards the diagonal. So, yeah, King H8 was kind of a move to. I guess defend, but I think that king is just really weak there. You can even go maybe rook h4 at some point and 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 threaten checkmate on h7. And if you play h6, well then f6 com becomes completely unplayable for the rest of the game because you create too many weaknesses. So very easy for white to create weaknesses here uh, for black. Oh. I think. Oh my god, he played f6. Wow. Never play f6. Never play f6. Look at that Eva bar immediately. That was the idea of going uh, king h8. He wanted to play f6 and get the king out of the diagonal. But now, now those pawns are just going to be so weak. How do you continue here? Do you go rook h4? Do you? Oh. Not a fan of this move. He brings the rook from the best square on d7 back to d5. I don't understand. Like, if you wanted to go to the h file, he had this perfectly good rook on f4. And. The, what the computer wanted was rook to g4. Definitely the most anticipated move in response to this, targeting the g pawn. And that's not an easy pawn to defend because our bishop really is just a monster here on b3. This this bishop with a tall hat, I think you called it. I did, because you called it one of the weak side, and I really liked it, so I stole it from you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're more than welcome to to lighten up the commentary. I think we still have a lot of good attacking chances here, but this was definitely a move in the wrong direction. Oh my gosh, Bishop A4 is just a skewer. It is. It is. Yeah, the rook on F4 is just defending that. Bishop A4, you can't go B5. I mean, this is just... Raj is kind of looking to the sides. He's wondering... Is he thinking about it? It's easy to think just about the king, you know? The plans have always been to attack the king. There are instances where you might miss it, but he doesn't. Oh, He's Raja and he doesn't miss it. He's Raja. He don't <laughs> miss. <laughs> exactly. He doesn't. I mean, now we see Osanir with just a few seconds left, 20 seconds, exchange down. Not a good position at all. Rookie for trading rooks could be, could be a great score. Um, yeah, rook h4 instead. Doesn't really matter. This is just so good. Rook d7 threatening rook h6 and queen h7 mates. How do you defend this? I don't know if you do. I, I don't know if you resign here. That is my question. f5 trying to prevent it a little bit. Also defending with the queen on h6. But queen h6 is possible. But can you just take it now? Can you just go queen takes f5? 
Are we going to see a rook coming into e2? We can't really. I mean, you're almost getting back ranked in that in that instance. Yeah, I think what black might want is to take on f2 to complicate things, but I don't know. This is looking uh, like it's barely holding on, if that. And Raj has got a minute to figure out how to break through. Um, I think, do we have another result with Antipov winning? So I think, yeah, also with the really early draw, Mizzou does clinch the win. We're not surprised there. We do see the trade of the F-pawns. So there are maybe some extra checks, maybe even some perpetuals, maybe even some mates. But I don't think it's going to work out. Um, but where's the win for white now? That, no, that, that is the question. I'm looking at things like queen f7 to target the rook and target on g7. But yeah, the question becomes if you have bishop takes g3, maybe you can go something like queen g4 or rook g4 or rook e4 to stop the rook from coming in. And maybe this is uh, a safer attempt. But we have now wow. bishop takes g3 sacrificing the bishop. There's the sacrifice. This was like the only, there was this check as well, but takes here and the idea is then queen to g1. And we're going to force uh, perhaps some sort of perpetual or or something. But yeah, best move is king to g2. Wow. Which, oh, he doesn't do it. Queen he g1. He doesn't do it. Here and now there's queen h1. Okay, here... King goes go up. G two, threatening the if rook at the same here, time. Here is there. Oh, this is so risky for both sides. It, oh, he's doing it. King h five. Wow. Look at look at Osander's face. He just went what? Queen takes e four, trading, but he's gonna take that b seven pawn. And White just wants to play this out. Wow, look at that king. Black is better now. They're up a pawn. Yeah, they're up a pawn. White didn't take the pawn. Yes, white has an active king, but what does the king do? It gets checked. It can't do anything. He's going after the h pawn, but maybe he should have gone for the c pawn. Oh, white really They're Roger racing really now. for the for the for the checkmate king g6, but you just have rook g3 check. Man, he really should have just declined the the bishop sacrifice and gone king to g2, saying, all right, you took my g-pawn, but he was definitely in the driver's seat, unlike Oparin. <laughs> just kidding. Wait, wait, there's a queen on the board, Anna. There's a queen oh on the God. board. Oh, it's Osner's over. winning. Osner is, Osner is winning, yeah. No, it's over. I mean, Raja declined that perpetual at the end. He really wanted to win because he'd had a better position, but... He's losing. He's going to lose. Yes, Missouri is going to win anyways, but still, it was an unnecessary point to lose in this way. Yeah, and Osner showing once again, he's a board four hero for UTRGV. Uh, what a miraculous save and comeback. Uh, but okay, yeah, this, uh, this rook is never going anywhere without dropping the pawn. This king is very safe here on, um, yeah. There goes this. And now Rook hoping for a stalemate. The exactly. Stalemate. <laughs> oh, wait. <gasps> oh, what? This is insane. If you take the wait, rocket, you... stalemate. Well, the pawns are going this way. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. How does he get out of this? Uh, he's going to block with the queen now. Wow. Wait. Chuck. Wait, wait, wait. Now, going? If Rook here, yeah, he needs to get to a point. Now, now the queen takes any check. Yeah, wow. so he's not continue. Look at that maneuver with little time. And here we have a resting nation by Raja. Wow. What an attempt at the end there to try to get the stalemate. He immediately leaves and uh, Osner gets the win, but that is not enough for uh, Texas Rio Grande. Missouri is able to win this match nine and a half versus six and a half. Joe, what an exciting match we had. What did you think? I mean, what a fantastic finish. That game was amazing. We saw a rogue rook from Raja, and it didn't work out because the king found safety. The queen was going to take that rook next and avoid stalemate. So ultimately, Mizzou gets the dub, 9.5 to 6.5. That was a close match towards the end, but... I think it all comes back to that first round. Mizzou was ready to play regardless of where they were playing from. 
and UTRGV, they're handed another loss here in the season. So Mizzou, they're going to improve their standings and they're really going to anticipate this next match because they're going to have all eyes on SLU versus Webster um, and especially considering Mizzou is playing SLU next week. So we're getting down to just the last matches of the regular season, Anna. Yeah, I think that we could see Misu in the top two after today's fantastic match by them. People are saying that they might win the whole thing. Team Chess Battle continues this Tuesday, March 5th. It's a clash of internet icon duos as Robert Hess and Daniel Narditsky take on Hikaru Nakamura and Gotham Chess. The teams will banter the way through the match with $25,000 on the line. But who will advance to the finals? Tune in this Tuesday to find out and use exclamation mark battle, battle in chat for everything you need to know. We have another battle of ours coming up. St. Louis University takes on Webster University. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. We're going to play Blindfold Blitz. So I'm actually going to get up right now and I'm going to blindfold him. All right. This is, you know, nothing weird's going to happen here. Trust me. There you go. Close your eyes, right? I'm yeah, going to move the pieces right. for you. So all you got to do is just say the move and I'm going to move the pieces for him. I'm going to start your clock. You just say your move and hit your clock. So, okay. Go ahead. Play one, B3. Okay. Okay. So he plays B3. I'm going to play Knight F6. He should be two. G6. Knight f3. Bishop g7. f4. f4. Yep. He got a good position. All right. Knight takes d4. Queen takes d4. Check. Knight to f6. Queen e3. I think you're doing great. Just so you know. Oh, thank if you. Wor if you're worried. Oh. Yeah, that looks like a very boring position. <laughs> Why am I struggling so much with the right thing to play here? Um, My plan now is just to try to flag you. Queen to b6. Yeah, that's a good move. I have 2 minutes and 24 seconds. You have 4 minutes and 45 seconds. I mean, I should have given you 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I know, I know. I'm old and slow. You're not 40 hit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to play rook to d8. I'll play rook uh, s d1. You play a lot of good chess moves. Has anyone ever told you that? No. How let you hold a freaking draw here? Come on, Dan. All right, rook takes d1. Yeah, rook takes rook. I gotta do what I need to do to win. <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do to win. I respect it. Knight to f6. Ah, what are you doing? You're trying something? I'll play uh, king to e3. Why did you have to see it? It was just <laughs> <pick> one. <laughs> rook, to, rook, to D, rook to D1. D? D1. Yeah, I see you, Danny. Okay. Ah. Uh, I'll play rook to C4. Okay, bishop to D5. I'll play rook to C3. Wesley, this is your chance to blunder. You can do it. Rook to G1. Mm-hmm. Push A5. No more mate. Rook to G1. Bone to E4. Oh man, that was an accurate move. Bishop to A, a B7. Okay. I'm just kidding. I like going A8. I can't okay. do it. I can't yeah. take advantage of a blind man. <laughs> King to G7. Uh, why, why are you running? That was a good move by me. It's not over yet. Yeah. Knight E8, check. I'm gonna play the most boring. King to F7. Arrow takes Bishop A6. Run it, Wesley. Yeah. King takes E8. King, King E6. King to F8. Uh, King to F6. Oh, wow. That hurts, actually. That's a big time. Oh, I lost on time. Oh, that was a big time. I will lost track of time. Wow. Good game. I almost feel okay about myself. Almost. Yes. Yeah, you're doing good for your first game after a long time. Thank you. Yeah.
I'd classify trading as a game, really, that you're playing with competitors and basically every market participant in the world. My path, I came in as a poker player, but I think that the main thing that everybody has in common is a sense of competitiveness and interest in, in gaming and strategy in general. Yes, you can actually use gaming skills for your career and for something to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Welcome back to week six of the CCL spring season presented by SIG. SIG is not just a trading company, but it's a gaming company too. Chess.com caught up with current Cornell University Chess Club president and incoming SIG cell site research associate Kimberly Liu about what makes this organization so special to her. My name is Kimberly Liu and I'm the current president of Cornell Chess Club I interned at SIG last summer because I noticed that their culture was very gaming centric and that is uh, quite a unique take. I think SIG values the gaming aspect because you're able to make decisions under pressure. So pressure is definitely not a strange thing in chess. There's time pressure, there's pressure of spectators. So being able to just stay focused and make the best moves or best decisions that you can is honestly all that you can ask for. I grew up in Davis, California. I was five years old and full story is that I was at an after school daycare and I saw another teacher coaching a student and they happened to be picking up the night. And at that time I was a pretty avid horse gal. So I told my dad and he recognized that it was a game of chess. He eventually learned like the basic rules to teach me. And from there I kind of took it and ran with it. <laughs> During the pandemic, obviously I had a lot of time on my hands and I was still very introverted, but I saw some of my good friends streaming. I was an avid like community member, avid chatter or spammer, but then I realized what if I was on the other side of the camera? So I eventually decided to give it a try on my very old like 10 year MacBook Air, but this whole process uh, was very invigorating and new and refreshing to me. A lot of my high school friends were very supportive. That was also giving me a lot of encouragement. I felt like I was just chatting to my friends from the very beginning. Coming from California, a lot of my friends were staying in California universities. I decided to go to the other side of the country, um, Cornell, which I didn't really have friends at, and I wanted to start anew and see what I can do just from the ground up. Previous years, I've noticed that there's not as much like communication between like a Cornell chess club and the local community chess club, and I kind of wanted to bridge that gap because it's so important to be just as intertwined with the community and contribute back. So that's why I decided to get more involved with our local Ithaca chess club. Oh, you're making this really tough for me. <laughs> It's honestly one of the best decisions of my life because I'm meeting people from all walks of life, from students who are just starting out to people who have been playing chess for like decades. And it's just such a heartwarming combination to see everyone playing chess together and like sharing joy over this game. It's crazy. Oh my God. I don't feel it yet because there's so much spice already in my mouth. Turn the thermostat up. Please, no milk. No milk. No fing milk, James. I'm gonna go to the ambulance. What's up, everyone? Chess is hard as it is, but we're about to make it even harder by playing chili chess. For every type of piece we capture, we are gonna eat a chip with some hot sauce on it, starting with the pawns, knights, bishops, and rooks, a queen. And then the loser of the game is gonna eat this drenched chip over here. Ready to go? Yeah. Here go. And here we go. Oh man, we've battled a lot in the. <laughs> it's like you're letting me take it, bro. We get, we get it. Instant, you must be hungry, bro. Oh, I'm too scared to, to capture. Oh. Take it, bro. No, 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 no. Because then we have to eat the. Eat the... what? Now you gotta eat the freaking chip. All so big. Ah. <laughs> oh. Yes. Oh, right. man. Oh. Mm. It feels like I'm inhaling a barbecue. I hate that one. That's mm. pretty good. God. That is the official. Worth our money. Beautiful. 
That was weird, man. It's like citrusy, but like correct. Kind of tastes like. Well, you know what? That's exactly what it would taste like. <laughs> I'm rolling up my. We got the end game with the chips. Okay. Uh, this is hey, torture. Which one do I want? Okay. None of these back. We, I like how silent psychological battle. Nobody's drank milk yet. <laughs> right. We're like, okay. All right. Ooh. Word looks different when you high on spice. <laughs> oh man. And we're hitting different. Oh, shit's kind of hot to be chilling. Like that. Mm. Oh, it's definitely getting hot in this room, guys. You didn't, hurt, you didn't turn, <coughs> turn the thermostat up? Mm. <laughs> oh, I took, I took a pawn, mister. Uh, oh, you took a pawn. You did. Damn, bro, you catching everything. Ah! Oh! You got check. Oh, my God, I lost on time. No! Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. Okay, so the problem is that uh, uh, I don't feel it yet because there's so much spice already in my mouth. So it's probably gonna be like how Magnus said, it creeps up on you. Yeah, now it's starting to creep up. I feel it. I feel it. Oh man. I'm gonna go to the ambulance. I'm gonna call the people right James, now. Hold my hand. Please, no milk. No milk. No milk. We're doing this with no milk. No fing milk, James. So I have two brothers. <laughs> we in a ditch somewhere. Yep. Explosions all around. No milk. We asked them, I'm like, you need a Band-Aid? No, I need no milk, son. No milk. Cool. <coughs> <coughs> I'm gonna feel that for a few you days, two hours. Me, bro. I did, bro. I did, I did. But you, your brain don't work right when all the spices are- No, bro. man. Bro, you know. I can't feel my fingers. Uh, Same time next week? Say <laughs> Sure. It's a date. Classified trading is a game, really, that you're playing with competitors and basically every market participant in the world. My path, I came in as a poker player, but I think that the main thing that everybody has in common is a sense of competitiveness and interest in, in gaming and strategy in general. Yes, you can actually use gaming skills for your career and for something to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Welcome back to week six of the CCL spring season presented by SIG. We are moments away from our second match of the day, which is literally like the match of the season, St. Louis versus Webster. Joe, how excited are you about this match? I cannot wait for these games to start, Anna. This is the top two teams of the league and perhaps I'm just going to say it, the world. This is SLU versus Webster. SLU, the back-to-back -back defending champs. This is a historical CCL team. Webster, they're the new blood. They're absolutely new to the CCL, and they're undefeated. They're 5-0, and looking to go 6-0. and They said it. They're the team to beat. SLU, they have a lot on the line. We watched them lose for the first time last uh, week against UTRGV, a close one. But they're going to be energized to come back. I cannot wait for this match, Anna. Let's take a look at how the standings check out after today's first match. We see there Webster and St. Louis at the top, followed by Missouri that has now taken over uh, University of Texas Rio Grande after beating them in that first match of the day. Joe, do you think that uh, Missouri will be able to come there at the top and beat one of those top two schools? Or do you think that this is maybe how we're going to be seeing the playoffs? Honestly, Mizzou has their own destiny in their own hands because they play SLU next week. So I know Mizzou's watching right now, whether they're at their home or in a parking lot, they're going to tune into this because they want to see how the competition does and if they have any chance. Because no matter who wins or loses this match, Mizzou will have a chance to break top two with their match next week against SLU. But Webster 
all eyes on them. They're at the top. They're going to go 6-0 and or they're going to get their first loss of the season. We're going to find out after this match. It's going to be very exciting. Like we've said, this is the match of uh, the season pretty much. You see Webster in St. Louis right there at the top of the standings. These two teams know each other very well. Not only are they chess powerhouses, they're also next door neighbors. Both located in Missouri, they're separated by only 7.6 miles. That is a 50 minute car ride, a 47 minute bike ride, a 50 minute trip by public transportation. And if you're feeling ambitious, a two hour and 34 minute walk. Yeah, those are some fun stacks, Anna, but shout out to uh, one of our producers, Lance, who has some even more fun statistics. Do you know the St. Louis Arch? Right no. there, we see the gateway. That's one of the monuments in St. Louis. These two schools are separated by 64 arches. Uh, we also see Bush Stadium. It's a big baseball town. They're separated by 101 home runs. And we see the giant chess piece there, home of the World Chess Hall of Fame. These schools are separated by 2007 giant king pieces. That is the largest chess piece in the world there in St. Louis. So this is a battle of St. Louis, battle of the arch, basically. That's uh, a big, big uh, city for the world of chess. So these are the top two teams in the world. These are the two uh, colleges competing from St. Louis. Like they could have done this over the board, probably. <laughs> they could. They could. And uh, yeah, like you said, St. Louis is a really big chess city. Now, you are from St. Louis yourself, right? So do you want to tell us a little bit about the chess scene in St. Louis in general? Well, you know, it's actually a little bit of irony because I actually started playing chess after I left St. Louis. I had no idea St. Louis had a chess club because that kind of started like as around the same time that I left. Uh, so I moved to California halfway through high school, and then I was watching YouTube videos, and I saw this this channel called the St. Louis Chess Club promoting the Singfield Cup. And I was like, what? Like, I could have gone in, if, in person if I had stayed. But uh, yeah, a lot of people, they know I'm from St. Louis, so they assume that's why I play chess, but it's kind of the other way around. The wait is over. Let's get to the board assignments. St. Louis versus Webster. I mean, wow, we're seeing the top of the top players. Uh, we've been following them all season. They've been both performing so well, both of these teams. Joe, do you think this is going to be a close match or do you think that someone is a favorite here? Oh my gosh, to say uh, this is a close match is an understatement. We might see double <laughs> overtime, triple overtime. I mean, I don't know who's going to win. These two teams have never faced off in a match quite like this. Like I said, CCL, first time Webster's ever played in it. SLU, they've won three championships. They are the veterans. They've been here before. They've played at the biggest stages, and they cannot wait to prove themselves over this Webster team. But I'm sure Webster, they're thinking they're the ones to beat. They're thinking they're the champions already. I mean, this is only regular season still, so... Another reminder, regardless of who wins this match, we still have the playoffs. That's where it all matters. But we see the players are all here and they're ready to go. Some of them might not have their lights on, but they don't need it because they can play chess blindfolded, Anna. <laughs> they can. They are so good that they can play chess blindfolded. Not against just one person, but against several people. They could do blindfold symbols. That is how good they are. So the match is just a few moments away. There's nobody sitting in a car. Everybody's having quite a normal setting, don't you think, Joe? <laughs> yeah, I do see Benjamin Bach there. Is, he's one of the players without his lights on, but he put the most channel points in this prediction himself. He's betting on his own team. He's got his own channel points on the line. A quarter of a million channel points, you guys. That's quite wow. the big bet. That's confidence. Uh, if you didn't think he was confident in himself, well, you do know now. And I'm wondering who else is going to put prediction points in there. I think that's a good bet for Webster to, to maybe take some of box points. No, I agree. I didn't even know you could put points on yourself, but I guess you can. So we see that the games are starting. We can maybe start with uh, Theodoro, board number one, playing as Gurgly Cantor. So we can maybe check out that game. I'm seeing that they're playing a King's Indian, and I love playing as the King's Indian, Joe. It is one of my favorite openings to play against. However, I play it a little bit differently. This is more of a main line. I like playing it with this move, h3. But there we have 
uh, Webster's Board 4 versus St. Louis Board Number 1. And we will see a little bit um, if h3 is played. Bishop e3 is more natural. The idea of h3 is to stop. Well, there we go. <laughs> Knight g4. Oh, <laughs> they're showing us in real time why you want to play h3. So, wow. I... I'm so excited for these two teams. Like seriously, I I want to say Webster might be the favorite because they're five and zero. Oh. Like Slu lost to UTRGV last week, but they were missing their board four for the first half. But we see all four players are here, ready to go. Uh, they've they've had this match marked on their calendar, uh, maybe even longer than I have because of how much these teams are rivals. And uh, another reminder, Anna, a little bit of St. Louis uh, fun fact and, and, and some trivia. Remember the, the mascots of these two teams that we mentioned earlier in the season? Yes, I do. Do you remember what they were? Uh, I start with the G, <laughs> with a G, I think, right? <laughs> what? Something. You're so cool. Yeah, Webster, they are the Gorlocks. Gorlocks, that was the word, yeah. <laughs> St. Louis, they are the Billikens. So Billikins? we have Gorlocks versus Billikens. <laughs> what is a Billiken, Joe? I mean, we're gonna have to ask one of the St. Louis players. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will have to ask. Maybe uh, someone in chat knows. You can let us know if you know what that is. I don't even remember the word. That's how difficult this word is. Bill <laughs> Billy? Billy what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Billy Pin. Yeah, it's Billy it's Pin. kind of like a spirit animal in a way. Okay. Um, like a good luck charm almost and maybe slu they're gonna need all the luck they can get to take down this this webster team but maybe maybe it's uh webster that needs luck to take down the defending champs uh web webster undefeated they they beat utrgv in overtime but utrgv was able to beat webster or slu last week eight and a half to seven and a half in round four so this utrgv team has been kind of the kryptonite for these st louis schools uh, but Missouri was able to take them down earlier. So in a blitz match, really anything can happen. Absolutely. Anything can happen. And uh, we're seeing right now, this is a very common theoretical line. I mean, I think I've played a similar position to this a million times in my life. Black is trying to play F5. That is what Black does in the King's Indian. You go F5 and white, well, white goes Queen D2 and targets that pawn on H6. And now typically King H7 is played. And then, well, you can play f3 here as white to have a place to go with that bishop. But, I mean, white is basically playing with a really, really bad light squared bishop. And so is black, actually. That's why you try to go f5 and try to give a little bit of play for that, for that black light squared bishop. Yeah, this is the battle of the bad bishops here with uh, <laughs> light squared bishops having some, some trouble getting into the game. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Talia, who's in the chat. She is a CCL player, an alum of, of the CCL. She's played for St. Louis. She's commentated on a lot of St. Louis matches, so it's good to see her turning in. I also see CM Rui, the captain for Webster. So we've got players uh, from both sides tuning in. This is definitely the match to watch, and it's happening right now. Yes. I mean... We heard you, Joe, saying that you've marked your calendars for this. When did you mark your calendar? How long ago? Can I ask you that? <laughs> well, the season was announced uh, back in December. Um, and shout out to CM Rui. He was a, a large reason why Webster was able to join and compete. So as soon as I knew Webster was joining, I knew this was going to be the match to watch. And lo and behold, six weeks into the regular season, these are the two teams uh, that are holding up in the standings. So, um, yeah, this has been a long time coming and we might see them compete again in the playoffs when it really matters when the, when the season's on the line. So regardless of what happens today, uh, these two teams are still going to be making playoffs and, and still have all the prizes to compete for. Uh, but this is a, a big one, not only for the standings, but also I'll say for their pride, because we saw around Hakobian top board, from webster say they are the team to be even though slu is the defending champs yeah he did say that i remember that and well we will see what he has to say after today's match but queen e7 was just played and i like that i think actually white might be preparing 
I was thinking maybe white was preparing f4, which looks a little bit crazy because you're opening everything up. So I don't think they're they're actually doing that. I think now what we're seeing is g3, and the light squared bishop is trying to remaneuver itself. We're saying that it was the battle of the bad bishops. Maybe now that he has to go bishop f3 and bishop g2, um, to try to just just try to get that bishop into a more useful square, defending that e4 pawn. But we see now black's break f5, and now. Pawn takes f5 immediately. The question is, do you take back with the bishop or do you take back with the pawn? That is the question of the sentry always in these positions. Um, and with, if you take back with the pawn, the idea can be to maybe push f4 at some point, especially with white having pushed g3. But he takes back with the bishop instead, targeting the rook. And now maybe, do you want to go bishop c2? Do you want to go back and try to trade off maybe? Yeah, I was thinking the idea of bishop d1 is to play bishop c2 opposite the king. and guarding this e4 square that black now has control over um that was the big hindrance of why you didn't want to play f4 because if black were to take that would open up uh the eyes of the queen to the e4 square so bishop c2 is played and we see the bishops perhaps are going to be neutralized there's a fight over the e4 square uh black didn't take with the pawn it said taking with the bishop so we might see some trades here but i definitely think we should take a look at uh, some of the other games. Let's do that. We can maybe check out Benjamin Bach, who is facing Harsha. And I remember Harsha having some really good weeks in the past. Um, I mean, I, I might be wrong, Joe, but didn't Harsha at some point get uh, almost a perfect score in one of the weeks? Honestly, I also don't remember, but I would not be surprised at all. In fact, I'd say like any of these players on any given week could go perfect, uh, but it's tough considering the level of competition they're up against. But look at the clocks here. Bach has three and a half minutes to Harsh has 20 seconds. Yes, I mean, that is crazy. Harsha just 20 seconds. Benjamin Bach, we know he's a fast player. He's sitting right now in, in darkness. And <laughs> he's, you know, just focused on the chess board. We know that he's fast, but it is crazy the time difference that we have right now. He's offering a, a, a trade of queens. So uh, white says no. And I'm actually a little bit surprised. Sometimes it's easier to play when you trade queens when you're low on time. But he's saying no. We're seeing a trade of knights instead. And a lot of pieces are being traded. So this looks like quite a... Um, as uh, uh, equal position that was the word that i was trying to find for uh but the difference is that maybe black has an extra pawn on the queen side that could be an advantage long term in an end game if a lot of pieces are traded i was gonna say the difference here is the clock and uh, okay it's yeah that's play. true <laughs> it's hard to play even though the position is even the the eval says it's dead even look at the time 18 seconds to three minutes yeah it's this insane is, yeah it is and, insane we're getting word Harsha Bardakati from Webster was undefeated against Mizzou of all teams. He swept the Mizzou team. That includes Oparin. That includes Antipov. That includes Raja. I mean, if you can sweep the Mizzou team, you can beat anyone in this league. So <laughs> we're we're got Box got his work cut out for him against Harsha. But right now, Box looking really good here uh, with over two minute time advantage in a five minute blitz game. Yeah, I am happy that I remember that correctly, Joe. I was scared that I was remembering it incorrectly, but I'm happy about that. I think that this is going to be really difficult for Harsha, but the position in itself isn't that difficult to play, in my opinion. Um, I feel like now, if you play, though, B4, that is the move that I'm thinking, playing B4, that could maybe pose a little bit more problems for, for white. Um, you cannot trade obviously because the the queen is hanging on b7 but instead king g7 is played a little bit more of a flexible move where you don't really are making any big decisions but now this b5 pawn could it become a weakness a little bit for sure we see white's doubling up on it but even though this is a time scramble i gotta take a look at our board three robbie versus yasser casada perez looks like we just witnessed maybe some inaccuracies being played I want to take a look back, back at, let's see, the eval was loving Robbie's position. What happened? Wow, d6 looks like such a scary pawn. Yeah, that pawn is a passer, but Yasser is holding on here. He gets the bishop in. Robbie's crushing here, but after that trade, the computer likes 
uh, the position a little bit better now because he drops the D pawn. Wow. And that was the pawn that was basically doing the whole possession. I mean, that pawn was so important. It was stopping the knight and the rook from being able to move. And now we're just seeing checks back and forth. Will we see king f8 again or will we see a different move? King d6 is what we're seeing. Now after check, the bishop is hanging so you cannot check. So you have to do something about the bishop. The bishop moves to d5, targeting the pawn on f7, rook f8 defending. And I mean, here it's equal pawns, but black has a little bit better, better pawn structure. Those pawns on a3 and c4 are a lot weaker than the pawns on a7 and b6. So definitely black could maybe be slightly, slightly better. But white yeah. has the bishop instead of the knight. Yeah, and we see that bishop's holding black's rook back. But the king is very active for black. And I really like an active king here in the endgame. We see some problems being posed here. So uh, Robbie had a great uh, position, but maybe he's going to have to fight on here. Uh, maybe even giving up the steep pawn for the A pawn. But there's actually a time scramble happening right now on board one back with Theodoru versus Cantor. Let's check it out. Looks like Theodoru has an amazing position, which is really oh, surprising considering the fact that, you know, he doesn't have a queen, but what he does is have that rook coming down to E1 and that rook together with those bishops are just controlling the position. Look at how weak the king is. The king couldn't go to F2 because of bishop C5. So the king has to go to H3. It almost has no squares anymore. How do you continue though? Do you go Rook. Oh my gosh. Oh wow. It's queen versus two bishops and a rook, an absolute imbalance. But this last move, h5, gives up the threat. The queen comes in, and now we're going to see perhaps a perpetual. Wow. Right when we come in, it looked like black was just <gasps> dominating that. Queen position. g5. <gasps> you could have brought the king in. Wow. Gurgeli now, missed an opportunity, and now it's a draw. Wow. wow. It just went so fast. I didn't even have time to see it. Finishes it and draw. That was a huge opportunity for Gurgeli. And now, I mean, yeah. He We're lost getting a lot here. of draws in. We are These getting a lot of draws. so evenly matched. Now it's board four, the one we haven't looked at. This is Aram Hakobian, board one for Webster against Batsurin, who's really low on time. Look at those central pawns. They're just pushing, but the rook can obviously take that pawn. And now, I mean, white's only chance to do something is going to be with that D pawn. But black also has that A pawn, although now after uh, knight C6, you're targeting the rook and the A5 pawn. So do you go something like rook F5? Can you do that? But that looks a bit scary because then the pawn maybe starts pushing. But I don't like going, yeah, I, I like staying there so that if knight takes H a5, at least the d pawn is hanging. So rook d1, threatening the bishop. Let's see where the bishop goes. Attacking the rook. So now the rook has to move again. Now attacking the knight, we can take the pawn. But if you take the pawn and the pawn on d5 falls, I mean, yes, cool. black is a pawn up, but I think that it's going to look or oh, sorry, the pawn is not hanging. Ah, yeah, that was a miss by me. Uh, it is yeah, Rook D2 now. defended it through the bishop. So Rook D2 is a nice touch here from Batsurin. Yes. So, I mean, it, it's looking equal, but obviously I feel like now Batsurin is the only one that could be better in any way because of this D pawn being so much better than, than uh, the extra F pawn that Black has. Yeah, White has the extra pawn, the past pawn. And so we're going to try to use this to push home to make a queen. But we have some issues here for the white pieces. This knight is hit twice, holding the, the, the pawn back. We see the bishop here blockading the pawn as well. Um, I mean, this is going to come down to perhaps a time scramble blunder. We will see. They have five seconds on the clock. The time is so low. I want to say that this is an easy position to play, but no chess position is easy to play, Joe, ever. Chess is a very difficult game. So, knight b3, going back and forth, trying to target that rook. Knight c6, hoping that bishop will take so you get this passed pawn on c6. The knight is coming around, threatening the bishop. <gasps> That's defended, but now we can push the pawn again. Rook's covering the bishop. We just need to get the bishop in to attack. And we see that's happening. Batsurin, he's slowly but surely 
surely advancing his pawn. Knight hits the bishop. Bishop tucks back. The threat is rook e7. So black's going to continue pestering the bishop. Two seconds for Batsurin. So low time. Threatening the pawn. the pawn. So if you go after the f pawn, wait. Did he just give the, the pawn? pawn? He just gave it up? He, he moved the king and he lost his pawn. He just lost the pawn for nothing. He could at least try to go rookie seven maybe to get the f pawn, but now he's just a pawn down. That's a check. Yeah, now Batsurin has to defend. We were liking his pawn so much, but he couldn't hold on to it. And now he's about to flag. He's got two seconds. So low on time. 20 seconds for a Hakobian. Such a time difference. Yeah, Ram's going to push to get the win. This would be the difference maker here in round one. This would be this little mistake, or not maybe not so little because you're giving up a whole pawn, but we see that these mistakes matter so much, especially at this level. Wow, rookie wow. seven so check. Aram, he's getting out of the way of the F pawn to push it. Yeah. This is going to be quite a long maneuver, but if someone is going to win, it's black. You cannot win this as white anymore unless we see the, the biggest blunder ever, which, which I don't think we're going to see. And now the H3 pawn is really weak as well. So there's only two. Wow, he's giving up the H pawn. With the heel going rook, rook U8. Yeah, that's tricky. Yeah, so it was a little bit of a smart, smart move for mistakes. So he's trying to somehow make, oh. make black make a mistake. Oh, wow. So now the F pawn hangs. Is he coming together? These two is. teams, Anna, are so evenly matched, it's insane. It is. We're seeing it. All games have been drawn so far, and this one could oh. very well be a draw too. But what were we seeing now? The H3 <laughs> pawn hangs. Instead, the king comes in. King takes g5. No, we see check moving the king back first. Then rook h7. Uh, defending that pawn from behind. We're going to see the G pawn pushing. The rook needs to stay on the H file. Otherwise, the H pawn is going to push. And now white is the one with the pawn up. <laughs> <laughs> He's back with the pawn up, but Soren is back. It's just the draw, but still. Oh, my goodness. They were trading pawns left and right. One player was up and then down and then up again. And what a roller coaster of a rook and pawn in game. Usually they're they're pretty even. I guess this one was too. But look at these two teams. Four games, four draws. It's tied 2-2. Two, two. It is just amazing to see, you know, how close this is. This could be going to tiebreakers. However, Joe, I was wondering if we could check out that game uh with Cantor where he had the chance versus Theodorus to get the win. Maybe we can just show what happened at the very end when they just agreed to a draw very quickly. Yeah, this game also was a roller coaster. Actually, I want to even go back further and see where this imbalance was created. We have a queen sacrifice for the knight on b5. Pawn takes, bishop takes on d4. This is like Bobby Fischer-esque. King in the <laughs> corner, knight, fork, windmill, picking up well, no, I guess he didn't take the rook. Instead, bishop takes, rook goes for a trade, and now we have the skewer. Wow. The skewer. You cannot take the back because rook e1, so the king steps up, and this is rook and bishop pair versus a queen. Where did we miss the win? Well, both players missed the win. Here was a big mistake. We needed the bishop f5 check, and this was good for black. But we see h5, allowing the queen to come in, and after these checks, the king needs to continue going to h6. Otherwise, as you see here, a big blunder. This allows white's king to enter the position, and checkmate is unavoidable. I think it's amazing because black has so many pieces, but there's no way of stopping that king from coming up to h6. The bishop on b4 is just too far away, and there's no time to solidify with bishop c3 and bishop g7. So this was the chance. But Cantor didn't see this, and instead they just went for a perpetual and drill. But Joe, I think that this shows that these small mistakes, they're the decisive ones. If Cantor would have won that game, then we would be having uh, we would be having Webster leading. So that would be huge for them, as now it's 2-2. And here we can see the player performance. 
Anna, do you think these players are nervous with so much on the line that they're not playing the most aggressive that maybe they're used to? Maybe they're being a little reserved, not going for any wins because the risk of losing is just so high. I think you might be very right. I mean, I'm nervous watching this. I cannot even imagine how nervous the players are. They've marked this match in their calendars too, just like you have. And this this means a lot to them. They don't, they really don't want to lose. I mean, this is just, like you said, on a personal level, but also on a league level, they really just don't want to lose this match. So I definitely think that they're very nervous. We're seeing now round number two starting and we can maybe uh, check out here board uh, one, for St. Louis, Theodoro playing against Arsha for Webster. So Harsha, very strong player. And this, I feel so happy with Joe because I play this as white. <laughs> oh, I thought you played the cow. Joe, I play a lot of different openings. <laughs> I am a very chess player, just like you should be if you want to be a good chess player, right? You can't just have True. a one-trick pony. <laughs> Well, I, I only play the Italian with <laughs> it's only E4. Um, that's been working out for me so far. But maybe probably I'd be better if I diversified my openings. Maybe I'll throw in uh, the cow here and there. Maybe I'll throw in A4, Rook A3 here and there uh, after being inspired today by Antipov. So, um, but yeah, you, you like this opening a lot for Theodore? I do. I mean, obviously, it's not like you're much better with white. This is just an opening. The idea here is that white gets a lot of space, but black is able to get out their pieces pretty quickly. The minor pieces, the bishop is going to b7, uh, the knight is coming out, and then you're preparing c5. So that is the important break here for black. And we see that if you're able to play c5 and you're able to target that d4 pawn, the e5 pawn becomes weak too. So it looks like white has a lot of space now, but black has a lot of potential to regain that space. Yep, and that's what the opening of the game is all about. It's about taking space. So um, that's why I cannot personally recommend the cow opening. Joe, what is this? <laughs> We're not even seeing a cow happening over here. Which, by the way, I would think it would be very amazing to see a cow in the Collegiate Chess League. I mean, that would be just the most amazing game ever. Um, you know, I know we have some team captains here listening to this. You know, a little cow here and there is not going to hurt anybody, but maybe they should have done it earlier in the season. Now the games matter too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought earlier. it was I thought you said the cow opening wouldn't hurt anyone. So, I mean, I don't know. What is it, Anna? Can they play it in this match or no? You see, the cow opening <laughs> is primarily for weaker players. You know, I typically say that when you're a beginner, openings don't matter that much. But at this level, at the top of the top with 3,000 rated players, yes, every small inaccuracy does matter, just like we saw in the previous round. So, we, with a very heavy heart, I will say that I cannot recommend the cow in this match, but wow. I am saying it with a heavy heart, and I hope nobody's clipping this and saving this for any future reference. Well, fun fact, uh, Anna, one of our viewers, one of the former SLU players, Talia, her chess.com username is Dishonor on your cow. So I don't what? know what that says. Yeah. Well, since when? <laughs> is this a new thing? No, it's not new. It's an old it's an old name. So she's had it for a while. I think pre cow opening theory creation. Okay, well I think she should play the cow opening to show that she stands by the cow and show that her name doesn't mean anything against it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a reference to uh Mulan, if I'm not mistaken. Have you yes. seen that? No, I have not. Mm, you gotta get on it's it's a good one. Okay, I, I'll, I'll check it out. I'll check it out. After we check out this game, though, C5 has been played on the board. We haven't even seen the Bishop B7. We haven't seen anything like that. Instead, we just have an immediate threat to the center. And now, I mean, if you play pawn take C5, black is just going to be the ones that have the amazing center. So you don't really want to do that. So what do you do here? Do you defend the pawn with the knight? Maybe. I mean, you would like to have a bishop on E3, but you don't. Either bring the knight out or probably bishop e5 check. Instead, rook to d1, saying, go ahead and take me, because then your d pawn is going to be isolated and uh, a target, a weakness for the rest of the game. So, um, yeah, rook d1, solid move. Black's probably not going to take. Uh, instead, they have some development moves. They can get castled. 
they're definitely still in uh, their opening knowledge here. Both sides very comfortable. The king definitely far away from castling. Both of these pieces still haven't developed yet, but I'm sure Theodoro is planning on it soon. In the meantime, maybe we check out some of the other games that are going on right now. Let's do that. I'm very interested to see what's happening between Benjamin Bach and Gurgli Cantor. So Cantor was the player that had this chance in the previous round. Now we're seeing this position, which is an opposite castle's position, which always makes the games a little bit more spicy. And we see this bishop on d6 being pinned. If bishop takes bishop, then the rook will come in and capture the queen. So the bishop cannot move right now. So I think it's a little bit of a double-edged position. I mean, white definitely has a big attack right now towards that black king with that bishop on g2 looking towards that diagonal. So I'm really liking this for white. Queen c4, queen d5 could be an idea like you're mentioning. Yeah, Bach, he, uh, he drew with Barada Kadi in the first round, even though he had like a two and a half minute time advantage, maybe even more at one point. Uh, but he's got a positional advantage here in round two. Right now, we have a lot of tension on the D file. We have the bishop attacking his queen. Right now, he's probably going to find a new square for the queen to go to. The computer likes just moving forward to C4. And I love this bishop, Anna. This bishop right here. And we're perhaps threatening queen F3 with mate. And I'm loving how white's playing this. Me too. I think that white just has an amazing possession. I'm wondering now what happens if queen f3, maybe it is to go bishop c8 and to go all the way back. So by moving that queen, you're opening up that path for the bishop to defend on b7. And here as black, you have to keep your calm, stay collected, and just make sure that you don't get checkmated in any way. Um, Anna, guess what the computer wants Bach to do? Bishop takes d6? It wants bishop takes d6, queen sacrifice. If queen takes e2, we have bishop takes c7 with a fork. And with the bishop here and the rooks coming in, I mean, that's going to be a lot of material for Bach. Surely he's thinking about it. He is spending a lot of time right now, so I think he's considering it. But Joe, when you ask me, um, Anna, do you know what move there is? I will always say a sort of sacrifice. That was the first sacrifice that I saw. And I'm happy that it worked out. But it is crazy to sacrifice your queen like this. Yeah, I guess he gets the rook back uh, with the bishop and the pawn plus an attack on the king. So we'll see. The computer likes it best. It's not so easy. Bach also, he's considering bishop here, threatening checkmate right uh yeah. how do you even stop that like do you push this pawn that seems really risky as well i think you go bishop c8 i think that is the idea um exactly. because you're targeting the bishop too so bishop c that's what i'm thinking like after bishop c8 actually feels like black has solidified pretty well it feels like black has quite a solid position there so we will see if he finds this queen sacrifice he's spending a lot of time and benjamin bach he's used to playing quickly i mean we always see him with a lot of time we have Gergely Cantor kind of waiting. I wonder if he's seen it. I wonder if he knows what Bach is thinking about right now. And this is one of those moves that's high risk, high reward. This is where it comes into play with your nerves, right? Yeah. Does Bach want to risk it? Look at all the time he spent on this. He was up on time. He played it. He does it. Wow. Wow. The confidence to do this, Anna. He gives up the queen, and now he takes with check. He's going to get the rook back for it. Wow, what a move. Absolutely fantastic. I feel like after spending so much time, you almost have to commit to this. And we have Benjamin Bach making two brilliant moves in this game so far. And I am sure that Bishop takes d6 is one of those brilliant moves. Wow. That is absolutely insane. And now... Kelly Cantor is stunned right now. He needs to play the most obvious, King A8, not waste any time because that time is really precious for him if he's in the back seat here against Bach. But, I mean, he's just shocked. Yeah, he, he's shocked. He did not see that move coming. He was cleaning his glasses and he was kind of taking it <laughs> slow. But then Bach just sacrificed the queen. And I think that that just kind of shows what you were saying before that, you know, the players are nervous, but the players have to push for the win. And here we have it. Wow. So Rook C8 is right now the threat with a checkmate. And Joe, you want to know a crazy stat? 
What is it? After sacrificing his queen, Bok still has 96% accuracy, and he's had zero mistakes in this game. Zero <laughs> mistakes. He's playing absolutely perfect right now. And, I mean, he's getting all the time back as well. So you mentioned rook c8. Right now, this bishop holding the position on by a thread. You're uh, right. Let's just go backwards. They do, but maybe we move our... I'm trying to see if we can get rooked. Oh my gosh, taking the A pawn. That seems really risky as well. Wow, that looks so risky right now. That looks incredibly risky. So, Bok, I mean, this is going to get crazy because we're both going to get low on time. And this is a very difficult position to play in Blitz. Can you go rook c7 here? Is that a possible move? No, instead we see the bishop retreating to g5. I was just wondering if you could go there to target the b7 pawn, but bishop retreats instead. Oh, wow, wow so you take that? Picking up all these pawns. Yeah, this game is far from over. Bach has played some brilliant moves, but technically these are two connected pass pawns. Black has a queen. I mean, Bach has to prove that his sacrifice was worth it. And the only way he can do that is by converting it. Right now, it's it's up in the air. Anything can happen. And what Bok needs to do is he needs to play against the king. He needs to do something now. He cannot wait for the end game. He needs to find something now. And we see a6 being played. Will rook a1 happen? Threatening rook takes a6 as that bishop is pinning the b7 pawn. That rook on a h8 is doing nothing. No, instead we see rook uh, b6 with the same idea of going rook takes a6. And maybe that is a bit of a more active move as now you can also activate the c rook. He misses Whoa! it. He misses it. Rook takes a6, bishop f4. Can you do that? It's a checkmate, no? That's it. That's it. It's can over. You he missed the mate. Wow, what a game from Benjamin Bach. He gets the first win of this match. What a beautiful, beautiful game by Bach. I mean, this could be the kind of game that you post as a YouTube video and analyze it in depth because it was absolutely beautiful. I think he should be very proud of himself. And I mean, we said it before, everybody's kind of playing a little bit more passive, but there we have the first game that's not passive and we see a decisive result. But Webster's still in it they're actually going for theodoru the board one from st louis both sides at 10 seconds joe can i give the you another crazy it. stat i just need to tell of you course, this. of course benjamin bach had five brilliances in that game five <laughs> i mean he's catching up with antipov in only one game <laughs> can you believe that <laughs> this Man, is the game I of the said... season <laughs> that's the game of the season it's the only difference right now but webster's answering right back tying wow. it so we saw four draws and now we see two decisive results theodoro goes down now we have two games left in this round this is the round of the decisive results solo time five seconds rook d6 it's looking pretty equal but black has that extra b pawn However, white has maybe a little bit more of activity with the bishop and the rook, everything targeting each other. So queen defends the bishop. Can you take the pawn now? No, you're not taking it. And now it's defended. It's defended. Queen trade. So Should this is looking good for Robbie. F2, offering a trade. Okay, so white's going to try to hold this for a draw. I want to look at the last game here that we haven't looked at. There we have it. This is looking a little bit more complicated with the rook, the queen, and the knight. Looks quite nice for black, but white gets this beautiful outpost for the knight on d6. This is complicated, and Batsuran only has four seconds to, to navigate. So little time. Black is up a pawn if I'm not missing anything, but pawns don't even matter, it seems like, in this moment. Well, I guess it does a little bit, obviously, always. The knight is remaneuvering itself. Try to get up to e4. And now knight oh. takes f5, beautiful move, sacrificing the knight. But if you take it, the knight on d6 is hanging. So now pawn takes f6, crazy stuff is happening. g6, solidifying everything. Can you go f7 check? No, you cannot, because queen takes. Now the knight falls. Wow. But Sorin's wow. just up a piece. Just, and he just forces the queeds piece. off. 
It is over. That's it. That's it. Wow. Wow. That is just incredible. But Surin uh, wins this game. And with that, St. Louis takes the lead after round two because the final game ended in a draw. So it is four and a half versus three and a half in this super close match, Joe. I mean, this has been so close, although this round has been very decisive. Yeah, we had four draws in the first round and then, I don't know, the wheels came off. We have three decisive results out of four games and SLU taking the lead. Webster, I don't know if they've ever trailed before so far this season. They have a perfect season so far, but Slu's going to jeopardize that. They have a one point lead, but it's only halftime. There are still two rounds to go and anything can happen in those two rounds. We will see if Webster is able to make a comeback, which it's still very close. So with the amount of decisive games that we saw here in round two, I feel like this can go either way. But it almost feels like they got tired of drawing and they said, we are not here to draw. We are here to fight and fight. They shall do in the last two rounds. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be going on a little break. But when we come back, we will have a winner. So don't miss it. We'll see you very soon. Any Good Chess Tactics book has one pattern in it that feels like it is on a completely different level than all of the other tactical patterns. Bearing the vivid and accurate moniker, The Windmill, this pattern features an amazing sequence of repeated discovered checks that can be used to win a nearly unlimited amount of material. The most famous windmill is definitely the one played by Mexican prodigy Carlos Torre against former world champion Emmanuel Lasker. But Bobby Fischer's Game of the Century also features a windmill. Here's another one that I really like. White starts with a rook sacrifice that leads to a combination of bishop and rook checks that simply consume black's forces. The Lafong is a dirty, dirty trick that will probably only work at bullet, but you have to pull it off at least once in your life. When you sense that your opponent is pre-moving g6 and bishop g7 to start the game, you can play d4 and bishop h6 to try to win the bishop on g7. Shakes, guys. No one is watching. Oh, they all missed that. I see the tilt. I can feel the tilt. <laughs> <laughs> it is a high risk and high reward strategy because you are hanging your own bishop if you don't catch them in a pre-move. But it is certainly hilarious when you do pull it off. Like one of my friends, uh, Asios, he made a um, bot. The report chart was ba partly based on hyperbullet games, so then you could see a lot of the Lafongs and Queen C2 takes H7 and so on. <laughs> yeah. so. Go and do that, please. Hey, you do whatever you like. We can't condone anything of the sort. No, we can't live.
Welcome back to the Collegiate Chess League presented by SIG. Plenty of Collegiate Chess left to be played today and plenty of chess coming up. We have the Team Chess Battle semifinals that are going to be so exciting with Danya and Hess versus Hikaru and Levy, which is happening March 5 at 8 p.m. Joe, quickly, do you have any predictions of what's going to happen there? <laughs> I'm a big fan of Danya. I don't know if you could tell by the puns. Uh, so I'm cheering for our fellow commentators, Danya and Hess. All right, all right. We also have the Collegiate Chess League Week 7, which is happening uh, the 9th of March. And I will be here then. So, Joe, we will be doing that one together again, which is going to be really fun. I cannot wait to see how the regular season wraps up next week. We're going to have the standings finalized and the playoff break brackets finalized after that match. So that's going to be super exciting. It's going to be very exciting. And then after that, we have Blitz Champs. And then we have the quarterfinals of the Collegiate Chess League, where I will not be here, Joe. I am so sorry. I'll be leaving you that week, but you will be doing amazing. And uh, I will be sad that I'm, that I'm not here then. <laughs> well... As sad as we are to see you go, we're going to be still cheering for you and rooting you on at the Reykjavik Open. So even though you won't be here, you are still got your, your plate full. So good luck in that. Thank you. Thank you. I cannot miss chess. I have to play chess. So uh, yeah, it's going to be really fun. But even more exciting is the final two rounds that we have in the match of the season. St. Louis University versus Webster. SLU is right now with a one point lead. And I mean, we are going to see if they're able to keep this up. Round three is about to start very soon. We have here the lineups. Is there any game that you're specifically exciting to see, um, Joe? Well, I think that we saw Bach have that absolute brilliant, fantastic game. Queen sacrifice and all. Checkmate on the board as well. That's going to be the player, in my opinion, to keep an eye out for. He's only their board too, but we saw Theodoru go down uh, to Webster in round two. So lots of chess left to be played. We still have half the match. Webster's still very much in it. They can get some points, uh, but Slew's proving why they're the defending champs. They're definitely very good at blitz, and they're up by one right now. They are. And I mean, we saw them lose last week, but they did play with a player last for a few of those rounds. So now that they have the full team the whole time, they are just playing amazingly. And the round has started. Do you think, you viewer watching this right now, do you think that Webster will win? Will they be able to do the comeback? Or do you think that SLU will keep this advantage and take it all the way? Let us know in chat. But we have right now Yes, sir, Cassetta Perez, who's playing against Nicolas Theodoro, board two of Webster versus board one of SLU. And we're seeing, I mean, the, this, was this a Rui Lopez that we saw? This was actually an Italian, a Joko Piano, which is what I like to C4. play. Yeah. Sorry, I should have said Rui Lopez now that I speak Spanish. I can't believe that I didn't <laughs> say it the proper way, <clears throat> but... <laughs> Here we have the position, and this looks very theoretical, uh, very common to play d5. Do you play this yourself, Joe, did you say? So I play both white and black of this, but I play the Italian and I play the Joko piano. But as you said, it's very theoretical, right? This is still mainline as far as I'm aware. C3 is the mainline. I personally don't play that. I like to bring the knight to C3, but obviously... Uh, these players know the opening better than I do. There's a reason why this is the main line, and perhaps we're going to see this knight rerouting uh, and controlling some of these squares. So queen takes back in the center, and now the rooks are connected. Black's going to put the rooks in the center. White still has some work to do. So Theodoro, he's comfortable. He's ahead in development. Um, still very much anyone's game. It definitely is. And with that queen on d5, it looks a little bit funny in the center of the board. But the thing is that you cannot really kick it away because of that pawn on c3. You don't really have knight c3 or anything to kick it away. And if you play c4, then you're giving up this whole, well, this this whole like hole <laughs> uh, on d4, which would just uh, really weaken white's position. So we're seeing here a bit of a bishop trade. Rook takes instead of knight takes, kind of surprising in a way, in my opinion. Um, I know. I personally like reacted to this because 
knight takes back with a tempo the most natural developing move but the knight wanted to stay reserved for g3 and we see with the rook left perhaps there's going to be a doubling on the e-file at some point but we see the queen move anyways targeting this b pawn and if the rook leaves also the a pawn might be hanging so i'm expecting maybe just a b3 but we also have to keep in mind with the queen leaving the d file now the rook is open to the d file so i'm really liking theodoru with the uh, quicker development rooks in the center um how do you defend this guy do you go queen c1 um if you push the pawn is there going to be e4 this looks kind of an, probably not yet because the rook and the knight are both there um, but still i think theodoru he's up on time as well so probably still very comfortable i agree with you maybe queen c1 looks natural to get yeah uh the queen out of the file so I, I think that this uh, game can really go either way. Let's maybe check out one of the other games. We could check out Benjamin Bach versus Aram Hakobian. We saw Benjamin Bach before with the beautiful queen sacrifice and Aram Hakobian, who's board number one for Webster, who in the past has said that Webster is the favorite. So let's check out this position. Um, so we're seeing a knight in the center. Black's knight on b8 is still undeveloped, and you don't really want to develop it because then the pawn on d7 is going to be hanging. But Black has this knight on e4, so very double-edged. Um, kind of a strange position, in my opinion. Yeah, maybe we take a look back and see how this one started. So we have around with the white pieces playing d4, um, and yeah, bishops coming out, playing in the center for white. There goes the E pawn. Wow. Trade castle. There goes the D pawn. <laughs> yeah, lots of pawns, but lots of activity too. Okay, so yeah, last move, 95, and we're all caught up. And Bach is, uh, he's a little bit in the think tank here. Uh, Aram Hakobi has about a 50 second time lead now and building. So I guess uh, this last move, we're opening up the bishop. Right, we're attacking this bishop and also attacking this. So white gave up a pawn early on in the center to get a faster development, to get the rooks centralized. So black, meanwhile, they're a little bit behind the development. We see a trade here, and now knight takes on c6. And in between her, if you take the rook, we're going to take the bishop with a check and with a discovery. We're going to get the rook right back. This is a really tricky uh, continuation here. Aram now picking up the piece. Bishop on the long diagonal, attacking the C pawn. We could take and take. We could bring the rooks in. There's a lot of potential for white, but we do need to note that black is right now two pawns up. So whatever white does, it has to be quick and it has to work because otherwise they're going to enter an endgame two pawns, two pawns down, which is obviously not great for them. But I do think that white will now be getting a pawn back and a lot of activity too. Yeah, so the move here is c4, save the pawn, put a halt to this pawn majority that black has on the queen side. Um, now, of course, Aram might choose something else, but ultimately the compensation for the two pawns comes from the lack of development here. The knight, if it moves, this pawn falls. And again, this rook in the corner is also opposite the bishop. So um, definitely compensation for the pawns here for Aram. Yeah, and, and the rooks coming in too. If you can take on b8 and go rook d7 and get those rooks active, that can be really good too. So it's going to be exciting to see how this game goes. We can maybe go and move on to game number three. We have Robbie Kevlishvili playing as Gurgly Cantor. And I'm seeing a big pawn chain. Look at that pawn chain. d3, e4, f5. And with the knight on h2 coming up to g4, it almost feels like it started well I, I was you know what i was gonna do a very gm thing which is guessing the opening out of uh, a position <laughs> and then i changed my mind joe because i started doubting my <laughs> what i thought it was i thought it was a king's in was it a king's indian well your guess is much better than mine i'm gonna have to oh this one this one was the roy lopez <laughs> I was, oh those are obviously it's not a king's indian the pun is not on d4 that was a terrible terrible guess but yeah Rui lopez here we have it we were asking for it and we got it amazing yep the roy lopez you're saying it much better than i am uh i have to do it for I the not, team <laughs> i i oh king f1 so castling manually by hand here 
Um, but yeah, I like that white has a knight. And the reason for that is because this structure is super closed off right now. They haven't traded any of the pawns, actually. All pawns still remaining on the board. And if that's the case, well, it's hard for these bishops to get involved. And the knight can hop over the pawn walls. But we're going to see some trades being forced here. I like the rook opposite the queen. Look at all these pawns in the center. Lots of trades, lots of potential for calculation and lines. And Grigeli Cantor spinning this time. And Robbie's very comfortable, both on the board and in the clock. This is the sort of position that <laughs> almost like gives me a headache because there's so many things going on. There's so many pawns left. There's so much tension, like you were saying. But now things are starting to open up. This is very nice. Rookie one. Pawn takes e4 is not possible because the bishop on f7 is hanging. So it's starting to become a little bit more uh, tactic, tactically, or tactical, that's the word. And now I think that a threat is maybe at some point e5. This looks really good. If you can go e5 and e6 as white, you are enjoying life. You're having a fantastic time here, I think. I think he's enjoying life with just the time difference alone. Uh, three, <laughs> he's true. got over three minutes on his opponent. His opponent less than 40 seconds uh, versus three and a half minutes. So he decides queen to b4, pressure on this d pawn. The rook just left the d pawn. So um, this rook couldn't have come because then that would drop the h pawn. So this is still a very balanced double-sided position. White definitely has the advantage on the clock and the board. So how do we break through? Obviously, we've mentioned e5. Maybe that's not the move anymore. Um, perhaps just simply defending the d-pawn is going to be good enough. And yeah, this bishop back here, this is a tall pawn syndrome bishop. <laughs> but what is the prop? Oh, okay, queen d1. Maybe now the idea is to defend the pawn on d4 and then go e5. I do think that e5 is what we want to do in general if we have the opportunity to do it and when i say we i mean uh robbie kevlish really <laughs> it's a team effort here the commentators and the players all working together here. we're trying to figure out the best moves together so we are yeah the queen comes back trying to guard this e5 break and i'm trying to think if there's a, a way for white to reinforce this right now black has four pieces covering this square white only has Three. So maybe the queen will step up and, and try to support on this diagonal as well. Um, we saw what happened when the queen was on the E file. Then our D pawn gets pressured. So a little bit of a. Okay, a going back, here. maybe testing. Yeah. Will you go queen before? And then, yes, he does. And then making the decision. Maybe you can go somewhere else now. Maybe queen E3. Could that be an idea? And this is really good for SLU because they're up by one, so draws favor them. And the thing is, Grigeli might not find anything better. And so he's got the buy pieces, he's got less time. A draw would be good for him, even though bad for the team. But Robbie, you can tell he knows. Queen here, defending this pawn. Pawn push. This is uh, going for it. He's, he's sending it. So now we see E5 coming through. Finally! Finally we have it! Wow, C4! just move the we bishop also, maybe maybe we could take wow yeah he wow. gives up the bishop he's taking because he's going to take this bishop with check bishop tucks back and now we can save our bishop no he's going for more but wait is there a rook sacrifice <laughs> all those pawns would be so crazy this looks crazy if that bishop on f7 disappears then i mean the f6 pawn is going to be so strong queen d6 targeting the f6 pawn how do you defend it you can go knight g4, maybe. No, you go c5. This game is absolutely amazing, actually. The king will move, opening up space for the rook uh, on g1. Maybe king f1, will we see that? To be able to go rook g1, you can't go king h8. The knight on f7 is hanging. So the queen, sorry, the bishop on f7 is hanging. So the queen moves back to f6, defending the bishop. Knight g6 now looks so strong. If bishop takes, maybe rook takes. Um, or pawn takes. I'm not even sure what you do there, but rook takes looks better in my opinion. So he's taking a think. Grigeli with only 12 seconds left. Robbie has all the time in the world to find the win, find how he can finish up this game. Oh my gosh, this game is so dramatic, but I have to take us to the 
Benjamin Bach game against Aram Hakobian. What is happening here? <gasps> it's a Bishop Moore for for Aram Hakobian. Wow. And he wins Bach there. Down. Aram. He's tied up the score for Webster. Wow. Four and a half versus four and a half. Every game matters so much. I feel like I never see Benjamin Bach losing this a rare occurrence, but he does lose that game against Webster's number one. That's this a game huge also, point like, for Ram. Here, White's winning a pawn, but up an extra pawn total, and you can't defend the B pawn. So that's going to be two pawns advantage for Theodoro. And that is huge in this endgame. That is huge. It's also, you know, those pawns and G and H, two pass pawns together, they're going to work so well. Check. Need to defend the pawn. F5. Look at that. Just dominating the position. Wow. wow. And Robbie gets the job done against Kirk. Gergeli Cantor. So slew back up by one and looking to actually add on to their lead if they can convert this one with Theodoru. Yeah, if they can do that, it's going to be quite a lead for them. I, I would guess the Grandmasters are really experienced in endgame. So I would guess that he feels confident in this. But <laughs> you never know. You're obviously. guessing. You're guessing. I, I think we all know that gr Grandmasters are, are good at endgames. But Okay, how do you convert the two pawn advantage? We see a pawn push. Uh, this knight trying to keep the king out of the dark squares, but yeah, keeping the king out of the light squares as well. Knight's trying to do it all, but yeah, but the how, knight cannot do it all. Point, I think you have to bring in the king. Wiggle its way in. Yes. Yeah, and then the problem is that when the king gets up to d four, white's king cannot move too far away because then, well, then the pawns start pushing g three h2 etc so now wow we see the moves happening so quickly he knows exactly what to do here this is yep. yeah easy job for theodoro and there we go there he wins the game yeah sir casada perez throwing in the towel there and that's a two-point lead now and we actually have another result harsha bardakati for webster keeping it close getting a huge very important win over batsurin uh, the board four from SLU. So St. Louis and Webster, they just trade matches there in that round, two to two. And so the score remains six and a half, five and a half, one point lead for SLU. And Anna, this brings us to the final fourth round. Unless there's overtime, there's only one round left. Can SLU hold on or can Webster complete a comeback? We will see that in round number four, but there is a chance that Webster does a comeback and that we take this to tiebreakers and that would be extremely exciting. Can you imagine this going to tiebreakers? Shorter time control, more decisive games, maybe more queen sacrifices. We've seen it all so far in this match, I feel like. So, I'm, you know what I'm most happy about, Joe? The fact that we're seeing so many decisive games. It's not just like the first round where we're just seeing draws. It's becoming more and more decisive games each round. I mean, we didn't see a single draw here in round three. Yeah, these teams are going at it now. Maybe first round had some nerves and some jitters, but they've gotten that out of the way. These teams are familiar with each other. They've played a lot over the board. They're used to this competition. They're used to playing at the top. So with the game the match on the line can webster rise to the occasion and get an extra point where they need it to tie against st louis could they even win in regulation this is the match of the season as you've called it i'm really hoping for overtime because i don't want to see this match end no i agree we're seeing such amazing chess it almost feels like an honor to be watching this and commentating to this chess all of these players are so incredibly strong and we're seeing the top of the co top competing against each other. So now the players are going to be playing against their respective boards. And uh, we will see if this means closer matches or if we see a lot of decisive games here too. So whenever the game starts, they're about to start in any second. We see a few people that haven't come back. And with that, I just mean Gergely Cantor actually. He's about to come back at any point, I'm sure. <laughs> the game's about to start. Out. <laughs> I'm sorry, Cantor, if you ever watch this back, but I'm sure he's getting some water or something and he's coming back now. The games are about to start and they do! We have now the game starting. We can maybe check out Nicolas Theodoro versus Saram Hakobian. I'm so excited to see what happens in this game. The two strongest players of each team facing each other. Yeah, these are the board ones. This is Aram Hakobian, who we all remember from the very first week, the 
the get-go of the season, he said his team, Webster, is the team to beat, and his team is down by a point right now. He took down Bach in a huge round three uh, lineup, and now he's up against Nicholas Theodorou. Can he complete the sweep of the top two boards? Uh, he's taking a sip of water there. It's important to, to stay hydrated. This is uh, his time to shine. So I have water I too. Know, this is a big one. Nice. <laughs> I also have water. Uh, so stay hydrated out there, chat. But okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Anna, if Webster w was to come back and to get a point in this fourth round, what board do you think they'll do it on? That is a great prediction. You know what? I will say actually the board force. Gergli Cantor and Batsuren uh, versus Dumbasuren. That's maybe where I'm saying, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we've seen Batsuren also playing really well. I think this is just, I have no clue. It could either be board four or maybe board one even, you know? Like, yeah. I would like to think that this might end in a draw, but I can also see this becoming decis a decisive game. I'm going to predict that board four is actually going to go in Slu's favor. And I think Batsurin's going to be the hero to win it. I think if Webster's going to have a chance to win, they're going to have to look at their top board, Aram Hakobian. This is their board one, their leader. He's got the match on the line. And uh, I mean, he's got his work cut out for him. He took down Bach already. Now he's got Theodoru. He did, and he also has a lot of time. He has more time than what he started with. <laughs> so we see him there looking very calm, and Theodoro is thinking, how does he continue this? Um, I don't really know what the options are. Is E4 an option here? Does he want a castle? I think there's a lot of different things he could do. I'm always a fan of castling. That's always important. Try to teach that to the to the beginners that are that are uh, learning how to play chess, and the grandmasters too also <laughs> like to castle. Unless you're Antipov, but but listen, none of us are Antipov, but Antipov. So uh, playing both rooks to a3 and h3, I don't know if I can recommend that to uh, to most players out there. Um, but you got to learn the rules before you break them. I think Theodore is going to castle here. He spent so long, almost half his time. Is he nervous? Is he calculating something? Is there really something so deeply deep to calculate? Bishop f4, Bishop targeting four. knight. Okay. Yeah, that is a. He's he's saying, you know what? I'm gonna play around with time odds. I'm gonna play with half the time on my clock. I think that's <laughs> quite the risk because this is Webster's top board. This is their best player, and this is, in my opinion, Webster's opportunity to get back into this match. You might be very right, but it feels like now Theodore finally saying, okay, we got to play faster, and he's starting to do so. But yeah, playing time odds on purpose is definitely not a, <laughs> a good thing. So something must have gone a little bit wrong. We can maybe check out the next game as well. Benjamin Bach is playing against Yasser Casada Paris. Benjamin Bach just lost the previous game, but now he's playing against his isolated pawn, which I think looks quite comfortable. I love playing as isolated pawns. Chess becomes easier then. The plans become easier. Yeah, and really important, like the top two boards for SLU, they have the white pieces. Um, we saw Aram Hakobian with black really pressing Theodore on the clock. So I think that's a good sign for Webster. But in this game, I think Bach has the advantage. As you called out, the D pawn is isolated. And we saw immediately the queen putting some more pressure on that pawn. We see the knight on c4 blocking the queen, putting pressure on the bishop, bishop to f4, taking the diagonal, getting out of the view of the knight. And maybe this knight will move with a discovery with the rook on d5. And uh, this knight also is about to be pressured maybe rook to the c-file. This is looking good for Bach. I'm thinking knight b5, if that could be something. You're kind of threatening knight c7, you're threatening the pawn on b5. Could that be a threat? Do you need to go now a6 as black? I am not sure, but I am scared. I am scared of knight b5. Yeah, knight b5, a really nice, nice idea. Really complementing with the bishop, uh, really just opening up all the attacks on d5 the computer is calling for a drastic move here from yasser casada perez and it's a super committal one it's not one you want to play g5 
putting pressure wow. back on white's pieces, forcing the bishop to move, this diagonal is really good for it. Don't you think g5 is such a grandmaster move? And yes, it is. Jasper is a grandmaster, <laughs> and he goes for that move. <laughs> wow. I mean, yeah, when, when the position calls for it, these players find it. We saw Bach find that queen sacrifice. We see here, not a natural move because this commits a pawn. Pawns cannot go backwards. This creates weaknesses near Black's king. So finding this move in the moment when it's needed, this is high level play here, as you called it. These, you can tell, are very talented grandmasters. There's a reason why they are with the GM title and over 2,800, uh, Bach almost 3,000, but mm -hmm. he still has the, I mean, yeah, Bishop back to C1, not what we wanted because the Rook wanted to go here. Um, so Yasser Casada Perez, he's finding the key moments. The question is now how you continue as white. I mean, Bishop C1 makes sense. It's the only square where the Bishop cannot be taken. And if you target a D5 pawn, you want to keep the Knight on C4 because uh, the, the pawn is the only piece defending that knight. So if you're able to capture d5, then the knight is hanging too. So it makes sense to not want to exchange the bishop for the knight. I like bishop c1. But now the question is, can you play knight b5 anyways and target that pawn? Or will we simply see bishop e6? I think that is what we do. So instead, queen b5 is played. Now threatening the pawn on d5. And if bishop e6, the b7 pawn is hanging. I don't know if you want to take it. It might be something you don't want to take, but you also have knight takes e6 to consider although that would open up for the rook on f8 so lots of moves here to consider to be honest yeah bishop to e6 just kind of holding things together if we take the pawn reinforces the center opens up the rook but this is also kind of a gamble we see this pawn is now hanging but if we take it the rook maybe attacks the queen uh or some some other variation but we see pawn here kicking the knight out the knight can come back with the tempo defending as well um and also this knight is now pinned to the rook after this move b3 it is so the queen has to move maybe we will see bishop a3 as well in the future at some point um or maybe bishop b2 i i'm not exactly sure but queen d3 is the place he chooses to place his queen at and now, I mean, the pawn on e d5 is not immediately targeted, but there's still going to be a long-term weakness for black to have that pawn. Anna, we got to take a look at board three, Robbie Kevlishvili versus Har Harsha yes. Baradakati. This is a huge board for Webster. Baradakati, as we've seen before, he's swept the likes of Mizzou. Actually, I'm not seeing the, <laughs> the moves of this game. <laughs> The moves are not there, although they are happening. So we will get those moves in just a second, I am sure. We are actually seeing it. And uh, we would love to show ah, you the position because it's a crazy one. Go. Good job, Sorry. Joe. I was looking at a potential overtime round, maybe some foreshadowing. Maybe, uh, maybe my mistake was on purpose. Maybe we'll <laughs> see. But no, OK, this is the game. Harsha looks like he's completely winning. And this is huge for Webster. They need an extra point to at least tie it. But he's very low on time. He is probably quite nervous at this point. 49 seconds versus over two minutes. I feel like Robbie Kevlish really always has a lot of time. He always looks calm and he always looks uh, or has a lot of time, although his position doesn't look as calm as his time does. So what is happening here? He does have those pawns on c4 and b3 that look a little bit scary. But is it equal material? One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three. It is equal material. I'm going to take a look back real quick, Anna, and we're going to take a look at how we came to this position. Yeah, because it looks like a very strange position, to be honest. Yeah, wow. A lot of queenside expansion from black, but neglecting castling which I called earlier is a very important move. So we see a trade, the pawn gets to c5, and now knight e5. So why can black not take on c5? That's my immediate thought. That is a great question. Bishop, is, it, is there some sort of knight takes c4 idea with rook a8? I'm not, I'm trying to think about mm -hmm. if there's something with the bishop and the rook, but knight takes c4, 
you can just go rook takes probably. You don't have to go bishop takes. I don't think we're taking on c4. I think no. there's bishop c6 check. Yeah, that makes more sense. Bishop c6 check. And the king will just be punished for not having castled before. Yeah, this is this is a tense position. And that time advantage that you called out from Robbie, it's completely gone. It is. He's thinking right now, can he castle now? Is that something that he can do? Or does he not really have time for it? Also, you just got a big raid from Nemo, last I year's did. commentator. Welcome, Nemo. You guys are tuning in at the perfect moment. This is literally round four of Webster versus Slew. Slew is up by one point. Webster needs to come back. And this is a huge position here for White. Harsha from Webster. It looks like he's going to convert this and win, which brings it back to a tie. But he only has 29 seconds. Thank you so much, Nemo, once again for the raid and people don't go anywhere because we might actually have a winner in the next few minutes and actually one of the games finishes aram hakobian takes the win against nicholas theodoru and ties it the score is tied right now this could not just be webster tying this could be webster overtaking the lead if they're able to win on a few more boards and they are better on several boards so this could actually be Webster winning, Joe. We might see the complete comeback, the complete turnaround. I called Aram Hakobian being a key player for Webster's comeback here. And we say a huge blunder. You cannot afford to make a mistake like this if you're Theodoru, allowing Knight E2 fork. That could be, you know, the game that decides this match. So, yeah, this kind of mistake is obviously not uh not something that you want at this uh, at this point and theodore must be extremely upset with himself for allowing that in an equal position so if harsha is able to finish this i mean webster's gonna take over webster's gonna be on the lead oh my goodness we have resignation resignation Seven Robbie doesn't half. even continue the fight he doesn't but we have maybe we can check out uh there we go this game that was exactly what i was gonna say yes we have here dambasuran who's leading against gergli Cantor. webster's leading by one point but if dambasuran is able to win this game it will be a tie again so very important he's a piece up opponent has a pawn for the piece but he is a piece up we'll be able to finish this Botsuran's totally finishing this anna he's also up a minute on the clock we have to go to the last game and see this is going to be the deciding one. Box game versus Yasser Casada Perez. It's two queen. It's a queen versus two rooks. It's a queen versus two rooks. Can he? You can, can just take the rooks. Can... Take the rooks. And Box it's... gonna win it. Wow. He's... Yes. Oh wow, my god. The pawn Lock. is just gonna push. He's gonna clutch it out for his team. This is He's... absolutely incredible. Oh. He put all of his channel points on the line. He believed in himself. And he's going to get the job done here. We see a resignation. That leaves us Over. with the final game. As long as Batsurin can convert up a bishop, this match is over. St. Louis wins then. Just insane. The nerves must be so high right now. But 43 seconds versus 18. Peace up. The queen is stuck here defending the checkmate on G2. Look at that king path. The king is activating itself too. And if you're just able now to trade queens, I mean, it's going to be an easy win, I would suppose. Joe, my heart is beating so fast right now. Oh my gosh, Slew, they believed in themselves. Webster, they came in saying they were the team to beat, but Slew proving why they're the back-to-back -back defending champs. But this game is not over. Batsura, and he's picking up that pawn. There's a absolute time scramble though this match not quite over we could see a blunder we could see a blunder but i'm also seeing pawns disappearing for white and pawns is the only thing that he has so he's calculating picking up that pawn now now black has even an extra pawn here there could be even perpetual black. and reminder even though you're up a bishop if you trade the bishop's not going to be able to win the game alone so getting that extra pawn for batsuran was very clutch now he's just trying to avoid all these queen checks. He is. And oh, Joe, I was really close. I thought I was going to sneeze there in this very important moment, but I, I did not. 
The king goes up to f5. He's trying to trade queens. You cannot trade queens here as Cantor. You must keep the queen. Oh. Keep the checks. And now you're forcing the queen wow. trade. It's over. It's over. That's it. This is just a one king and pawn in game. Beautiful technique here from Batsurin. He's going to force that last pawn and queen off the board. He's going to give up his bishop, but he's going to be left with the two pawns. Only hope is perhaps a stalemate. <laughs> but we're going to see hope. Cantor just run out of time. Yeah, wow, what a match. That is, it is finished, Joe. I cannot believe this. Slew taking the win. Webster hadn't lost a single matchup until this point, but we are now seeing that turn around slu is the winner of this really important match wow joe i don't i, I don't even know what to say benjamin bach being such a key player after that beautiful game with the queen sacrifice and now getting that really special and important win joe what do you have to say about this match all i have to say is that i guess this proves it billikens are better than gorlocks at chess <laughs> Uh, I still need out. to see a picture of that. Wow, <laughs> that is just yeah. I am I am honestly out of words. I am speechless. But like you said before, this shows why St. Louis is the back-to-back -back winners. When they must, they do it. They clutch, and they did that here. This was probably actually my favorite match of the whole of the whole season. Yeah, this was absolutely incredible. And we're going to have to bring in one of the players in on an interview. So let us know if you guys have any questions for this slew team. They just handed Webster their first ever loss in the Collegiate Chess League. So right now, slew is, I'm assuming, ahead of Webster on tie race. So they leapfrog over them, taking the top spot in the league. We are going to be having Benjamin Bach, the key player of slew, joining us after this break for an interview so don't go anywhere you don't want to miss what bot has to say we'll see you very soon we first thought that we had experienced the chess boom that had washed over us in 2019 at the end of 2018 yep. kind of going into 2019 we kind of looked at it, oh well that was guys that was the chess boom and oh we're in a new level we, 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 we it was kind of then but then like literally like COVID happened we were ramping up so quickly in each country that locked down italy india but you could see the registrations flying through as each country locked down and it was all happening so fast there was no like oh this is so cool this was like Oh my gosh, we're going to, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we literally couldn't keep up. And so there was no like positive coolness out of this. It wasn't until like we were into the, you know, pandemic and then like several months and we're like, oh, wow, this, okay. Well, during the pandemic, more people are going to play chess. It will die back down. Nope. Then came Pog Champs. And what Dean talked about. And we're like, oh my gosh, then, okay, after that, it will, nope, okay. And then came Queen's Gambit. We're like, all right, well, that was definitely the peak. And then, we'll and then the media started writing about chess. And then, okay, where is it going to stop? We, we have been... And then Pog Champs 3. You're just getting hit wave after wave after wave. And then there's the stuff in the media now, which is like wave. And like, we, we almost can't even come up breath fast enough to recognize this before we, there's like another wave coming from this point on we just don't know what to expect is there another wave coming probably <gasps> He's, i was here i was i was lost uh, okay well hey eight let's go Oh no, I think I should have just done that. Chat, I got 14. We beat it. Let's go. <laughs> no, 15, unreal. No, first try. Eight in a row, nine in a row, baby. Let's go. Let's go. I got a, oh cool. I got a little achievement thing. I honestly really enjoyed that. That was really cool. Become a chess.com community streamer at go.chess.com slash start streaming. What's the best way to follow any chess event from the World Chess Championship to the candidates, the Speed Chess Championship, Title Tuesday, and so much more? Chess.com slash events has all of the top chess tournaments played both over the board and online. Analyze and review games from the world's greatest players with live commentary, cloud analysis, 
Opening Explorer, and Table Bases. Find all the key event information, including schedules, prizes, results, news reports, player bios, tie breaks, and more. Even compete by voting for your predicted results. Explore chess.com slash events today on web or with our iOS and Android apps and experience chess like never before. Classified trading is a game really that you're playing with competitors and basically every market participant in the world. My path, I came in as a poker player, but I think that the main thing that everybody has in common is a sense of competitiveness and interest in, in gaming and strategy in general. Yes, you can actually use gaming skills for your career and for something to do on a day-to-day -day basis.
Welcome back to week six of the Collegiate Chess League Spring Season presented by SIG. We are joined by the star of St. Louis University today, Benjamin Bach. Benjamin, congrats on that. It must feel amazing to beat Webster. You were the first person to have a decisive game today. How long did it take you to see that beautiful queen sacrifice? Did you see it immediately? Uh, hey, Anna. Hey, Joe. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I saw the queen sack immediately, but I wasn't 100% sure if it was that, that good. But I figured, you know, practically, I have good chance to trick him as we were getting into a time scramble. And that's pretty much how it played out. Uh, yeah, I think it was very difficult for him to play. So, um, yeah, very happy with that one, one because every point mattered in this match. Bach, congrats again on your win. A spectacular finish against Webster, one of the strongest teams out there. Uh, obviously, you guys came off of a big match last week, losing by the same score to UTRGV. Do you feel like going into this match, maybe coming off of a loss, were you maybe a little nervous, especially playing against such a strong team in Webster? I mean, we, I wasn't nervous or anything, but we really wanted to win this one because if by winning this one, we have a very good chance of finishing in the top two. Yeah, yeah, last week was a bit of a mess because first of all, Batsuren missed the first two games, so we were already down 0-2. And I was playing from the lobby, from the Chase Park Plaza, uh, a hotel that's quite famous now. And I was just distracted pretty much every game. And Nico also didn't get a lot of points on the board. So it was just a very tough matchup that we uh, lost by the narrowest of margins. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, I feel like if everyone's in good shape, we were the favorite against anyone. But yeah, last week was just pretty much everything going wrong that, that could go wrong. Uh, but happy to, that we showed today that we're, we're the best team. Yeah, we, we saw you playing in that lobby and we were wondering what was happening. It did look pretty distracting. Um, I have a question that is not about the match, but it's actually about your university. I heard that you have a mascot called the Billiken, and I have been wondering the whole match, what is the Billiken? Can you explain that to us? It's a good question. Yeah, like you can look up the Billiken on, on Google. It's, I don't even know what, well, I just, uh, I, I Googled it for you. The Billiken okay. is a mythical, good look figure who represents things as they ought to be. Yeah, uh, I, I, I honestly don't know. Like, I remember when I joined St. Louis University, they gave us a whole talk, like what it means to be a Billiken. And they said, well, to be a Billiken, it doesn't mean to be like a creep, creepy, uh, uh, creepy uh, creature, but it means like all of these, uh, all of these things. But yeah, honestly, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe uh, someone in the chat knows. <laughs> Well, uh, I mean, I'm glad that uh, you guys were able to prove that Billikens are better than Gorlocks. And obviously, both schools in St. Louis, St. Louis being a big chess city, lots of rivalry matches. I hope to see from you guys again in the future. You guys have played over the board against each other. Um, apparently, in week one, we had a Ram Hakobian, Webster's board one, say that they were the favorite. The quote being, I think Mizzou is there. St. Louis University is also quite good, but I do believe that we are the favorites. So Benjamin Bach, I wanted to ask, how does it feel to maybe put those uh, beliefs to rest after today? Yeah, we don't tolerate any disrespect. So today we show that we are the best team. That's all I can say. There's nothing more that needs to be said, to be honest. <laughs> after that um we also had a few questions from chat and this is also a non chess question but chat is super curious to know benjamin what is your favorite class in college um good question well i remember i had a uh uh class freshman year which was a lot of fun it was on theology and uh, we had a great teacher uh, nicholas was in that class as well but our teacher, he would call him Theodore all the time. I mean, he would sort of confuse his first and last name. But that was a great class. I definitely enjoyed uh, enjoyed that one. So uh, our, our teacher was uh, Dr. Werner. So, you know, if he's watching by any chance, big shout out to him. Probably, that was probably my favorite class of, uh, you know, uh, at, at, at St. Louis University. I love that you're able to take classes with some of your teammates. Uh, so that seems pretty fun. I'm sure you and Theodore, not only teammates, but also classmates and maybe studied together, I assume. But um, there's another viewer question. I do want to mention that even though you guys won today, it's still not yet in the playoffs. So 
still who's the best in the league is to be decided. But you guys did come off with the win today, a huge win at that. The question from Perrin Abara77 asks, how will the team celebrate the victory today? Well, actually, Robbie and I are going out uh, to dinner with uh, with a buddy of ours. So, yeah, that, that's what we're uh, going to do. And there might be a tournament at the St. Louis Chess Club that I will play this evening. So that's probably how we'll uh, how we'll celebrate. I'm, I'm just a little bit surprised that there's no questions from the hype man. I, I would I would expect that he's uh, spamming the chat again. Well, congratulations, Benjamin Bach, and congratulations to your team. It was amazing to follow this. Good luck as well next week. And uh, speaking of next week, let's go ahead and look ahead on what future matches we're going to be having. So we're going to be seeing St. Louis versus Missouri, Webster versus Chicago, Prague versus Texas Rio Grande. And then, Joe, what, what does this at the end mean? <laughs> well, Texas already played Athens back in week five because there were a lot of matches that had to be rescheduled. That was the week for US amateur team. That was also uh, a week where a lot of tournaments were playing played in Texas. So we ended up having that match rescheduled and played early. So there's only three matches happening next week, and we're probably going to keep our eyes on St. Louis and Webster as they're still fighting for those top spots in the standings. So definitely tune in next week and see St. Louis still has their work cut out for them. We saw Mizzou win earlier today. So that's going to be a big match as well. Here we have the current standings. Joe, what is on the line next week? What is it that we should be looking for the most, would you say? Well, next week, what's on the line is the regular season standings because that is the final week of the regular season. We're going to have the standings finalized. The playoff brackets are going to be set and we're going to see where the teams fall in the bracket and we're also going to see teams be eliminated the bottom two teams are going to uh, go home after week seven so right now it's athens and prague but they just had a match today we're going to still update those standings so the whole season's at stake tomorrow or next week anna that is a fantastic way of putting it the whole season is at stake next week so you do not want to miss it Today has been a fantastic match, uh, matches. We've seen two amazing matches. This last one has been a nail biter with Slu coming at the top. Joe, as always, it's been a pleasure to commentate with you. You are the best co-host that I could have. So <laughs> thank you so much for, for commentating this with me and for uh, yeah being, uh, being an expert at everything with CCL. And uh, we will be back next week, both of us, with the most important week of them all. The whole season is at stake. Thank you so much for watching, everybody, and we'll see you all next week.